welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. I'm one of your co-hosts, Chris Bixby, and with me today is our other co-host, Matt Bingle, his pal Julius, and our host, Jake Deffenbaugh. How are you guys? Hey, we're doing good. great, Chris. We're How about you? Doing good. Doing good, doing good. Doing what do we have today? Today's guest, very excited. He is a puppeteer, and in addition to that, he also designs and builds puppets. Um, some of the puppetry shows he's worked on include uh, Sesame Street, uh, Between the Lions, Bear in the Big Blue House, Book of Pooh, a lot, a lot of other things that we'll be talking about. He was also a part of Avenue Q, the original cast of that, which is turning 20 this year, and we'll be talking about that too. And here he is, Rick Lyon. Rick, how are you? Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on your show. Yes, yeah, of course. Pleasure. Happy pleasure. to have you on. I see I see lots of puppets. I got I got my puppets here. You got your puppets there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so yep. to kind of, so to kind of kick things off, could you uh well, I know I kind of did already, but could you kind of like introduce yourself and like uh what you do? Well, uh my name is Rick Lyon. I am a puppeteer. Uh I'm more than a puppeteer. I'm also a puppet designer and builder. This is my shop, the space that I'm in right now that you can see all here behind me. This is about I don't know, you can see maybe, you know, like a quarter of it. Um Way back there in the back, that's the paint room right there. You can see spools of thread. The sewing machines and stuff are right here. That's the sewing area. And wow. obviously over here, this is all the all the puppet racks. Well, not all of them. Some of the puppet racks, which uh, are mostly occupied right now by my rental set of puppets for Avenue Q that I rent out to uh, regional uh, productions of the of the show. Um, wow. I, uh, I've been a puppeteer forever um i started doing puppetry when i was a little kid um really the first things that i saw on tv now, now your podcast is like what eight hours long right because <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll it's hard for me to talk i've i've been around longer than all of your ages all added up together so i've been doing this for a long time um puppetry thing I was always attracted to as a kid when I was a kid the puppets that were on TV were like um the first puppets that I remember seeing on TV were on Captain Kangaroo the original Captain Kangaroo show oh yes way, way, way yeah, of course. um I was not somebody who who grew up up with Bill Baird. Bill Baird was a sort of a regional phenomenon. He was mostly in the New York area, and I mm -hmm. grew up in upstate New York and didn't have access to Bill Baird's work. But so what I was mostly seeing was um, kids shows on TV. And mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason, you know, it, it I was attracted to puppetry. Uh, it was an exciting form to me. And it's something that I started off as an amateur way, way young as I was a kid. By the time I was eight, 10 years old, I was making my own puppets. Um, and then Jim Henson's Muppets came into my life. I started seeing Jim's work on um, variety shows, his early work, like on the Ed Sullivan show and the Perry Como TV specials and Andy Williams and, you know, all the Hollywood Palace, all the old variety shows. And that's when my life turned a corner. I was like, okay, these puppets are weird. They are, are not like anything I've seen before. They they are smart. They're edgy. They blow things up. They eat each other. Um, it, you know, that, that became the form of puppetry that I was like, okay, this speaks to me. And from then on, everything that I was trying to do with puppets was imitative of uh, Jim's work. And then when I was, let's see, 11 years old, Sesame Street came on the air. So there were Muppets on TV every single day. Oh, yes. The week. And, and repeats on weekends. So suddenly there was access to like, you know, Muppets seven days a week. Um, and that sort of cemented in my, you know, in my mind, wow, these are, these are cool puppets. These are awesome. Um, that's also the first TV show I ever saw in color. So that was, that was like, 
you know, a big, a big thing, Sesame Street debuting. Um, so I kept doing it as a hobby all through my childhood into, into school. Um, I found out that doing puppet shows was a good way to get a, an A in school because it was a creative project. Of course, I was working way harder than anybody who was doing just a damn report, you know, a book report because I was being creative and I had to make puppets and write scripts and make props and all that sort of stuff. But it was something that I was fully invested in, you know, something that I wanted to do. Um, I continued doing puppets. One of my, one of my very, my first public shows were for like churches, like a lot of people have, have done. Um, but my first public, public performances was actually at a, at a language fair. My very first public, uh, puppet performance was in German. Oh, wow. Um, wow. so it's something wow. that I kept in my, it's something that I kept in my pocket, something that I did, um, and when I got to college, I was a music major in college, um, but that was sort of the, that was sort of a compromise. I really, really wanted to do theater, um, which is was my other interest besides puppetry. I was an actor, mm -hmm. right. um, and so after my first year of school, I changed to theater, and I still had puppets that I slept along with me, and somehow or another, my and I and I honestly I can't remember how, but somehow or other my college professors found out that I did puppetry, and one of my one of my theater professors um, asked me to do. Uh, she was she was on the um, booking committee for um, a huge arts festival. I went to school at Penn State. There's a huge annual arts festival every summer at Penn State called the Central Pennsylvania Festival of the Arts. She was on the board and picked talent and stuff like that. And she said, why don't you do, um, you know, puppet shows for that? And I started doing outdoor performances and the huge arena thing. So we're like thousands and thousands of people seeing my shows uh, for the first time rather than just a couple dozen at a time. Mm -hmm. And then the theater ensemble, the children's theater ensemble that she had which toured to schools in the central Pennsylvania area, lost state funding. So that she needed programming or the, the, the state needed programming in central Pennsylvania for arts outreach for schools. And she recommended that I do that. And suddenly I was doing puppet shows every Tuesday and Thursday all year long for dozens and dozens and dozens of schools. Wow. And so I'm a theater major and I'm doing puppet shows. And um, I was, I've always been this kind of nerdy, geeky guy. Um, I've always been a character actor. And as a character actor, you know, when you're in college, almost everybody's a, an ingenue. You know, everybody's the same age. Everybody's Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. So character guys like me are the exception rather than the rule. And so I was in like every show. You know, I just I was in everything because they're always they always needed a guy who looked older. They always needed a goofy character guy. So I was doing shows at Penn State and I was doing uh, theater shows and then I was also doing puppet shows. So people were seeing me all the time. And as I went through school, suddenly I was doing like more puppet shows than it was theater. And it was while that was going on that I kind of went. You know, this thing that I've always done as a hobby, maybe, maybe maybe it's a career thing. Maybe it's something you can do. And so after college, I stayed in that community and became a puppeteer like full time. I did, you know, the whole birthday party circuit and stuff like that and still did the Central Pennsylvania Festival of the Arts. But I was kind of I was suffering fraud syndrome. Because yeah. I was a puppeteer, I was making my living as a puppeteer. I was a puppeteer full time, but I'd never studied puppetry. All the puppetry that I did was just, you know, learning by example or self-taught. And so after college, I was like, you know, I, I should get some training. If I'm going to pretend that I'm a puppeteer and I'm going to call myself a professional puppeteer, I should get some training. And again, that same, very same theater professor who got me started publicly performing in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. uh, got me hooked up with the puppetry program at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center, which is not the same as the puppetry program that's not there now. There was 
a sadly discontinued puppetry program there that was a year-long um, puppetry program, a degree program. Uh, it was called the Institute for Professional Puppetry Arts that Bart Rockaburton, who is now the head of the Yukon Puppetry Department, was doing. Uh, but that doesn't exist anymore. But anyway, so I went there in what was called, I'm the one and only introductory program student that they ever had. They offered for wow. one year, they offered uh, a semester, which was an introductory program. It was one semester long. And while I was there, I was meeting full-time professional puppeteers and puppet practitioners for the very first time in my life. I, wow. I'd always lived as a puppeteer in a bubble. And suddenly at the O'Neill, there were other people. And I was like, wow, okay, so maybe this is a career thing. It, maybe it is a valid choice uh, to pursue full time. And while I was at the O'Neill, Richard Termini, who went to UConn and knew Bart from his time oh, yeah, at yeah. Uh, UConn, was one of the guest instructors of puppetry. And of course, Richard at the time was working at the Muppet Workshop. And Bart Rockaburton, who was running the IPA program, who knew of my proclivities and my obvious bias towards Henson style, said, why doesn't Richard give you a tour of the Henson facilities? And so Richard was my first contact with the Henson company. Okay. Um, he took me nice. uh, to, to, to the workshop and all that sort of stuff. And while I was there, um, it was it was a, it was an absolutely perfect time to be there. You would have thought it was bad, but it actually it was good. Nothing was happening. They had nothing in production at the time. They had just wrapped Sesame Street for the season. Now, you have to understand that Sesame Street used to be full-time employment for a lot of people. They did 130 episodes a year. Wow. Now they do a couple dozen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's spread out all over the place. Mm -hmm. But back then, it was just this endless cycle of 130 episodes a year. They... They would, the workshop was working all year round on it. And the show had just wrapped for that season. That was season 18, I think. And so everything had shut down and all the puppets had come back to the Muppet workshop for refurb. But they had just finished the season and the entire workshop was all burned out. They were all dizzy from having pulled all nighters to finish up the show and all that sort of stuff. So there were puppets lying everywhere that they had brought back to the studio to repair. And everybody was kind of giddy and goofy and silly because they just finished up all this intense work. So there were puppets lying everywhere. And the very first Muppet I ever tried on, one of the the lady who was at the, in charge of the workshop at the time, Carol Lee Wilcox. Oh, uh, yes. The name you should oh, yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, yes, rest in peace. Important. Yes. Carol Lee mm -hmm. Wilcox was a wonderful, wonderful builder and designer and was right on the ground floor of the early days of sesame street oh, and yeah, the expansion definitely. of the workshop from just a couple of people to lots and lots of people um thanks to the explosion of popularity that the muppets received thanks to sesame street anyway mm -hmm. so she was there and she was helping you know give richard with the tour and she said uh, well have you ever had a muppet on before and i'm like well of course not you know when have i ever had the opportunity to have a muppet and she said why don't you try and grover so the very wow. first actual Muppet that I had on was a Grover. And I just, you know, she was like, oh, just, you know, do something with it. And I was just flailed it around. And there must have been, first of all, I have to tell you that Grover is like the best Muppet puppet in the world. There is no better functioning or perfect Muppet than Grover because he's built... His, his, the way he is built totally conforms to the anatomy of the human arm. His head is up here. His neck is right where your wrist is. His body is is cl tight, close to your arm. So anything that you do with your hand translates immediately to the puppet. So Grover is like the world's best puppet to put on. And don't forget that I'd been doing lip sync style puppetry imitative of Jim's work for decades already. And I'd been doing my own live shows. I'd never worked on television, but I'd been doing my own live shows. So I knew the mechanics of lip sync already. And she must have saw something in my experience that she thought was good because she said, you know, you should talk to somebody about getting an audition, which I thought was insane. You know, I'd been there for 10 minutes. 
And I was like, yeah, right. Yeah, everybody wants to work with puppets. <laughs> and, and I left and it was over, you know, and I went home and I was thinking, you know, she wouldn't have said that. She wouldn't, she wouldn't pull my leg. She wouldn't lie to me. So I was like, well, okay. So I got the number for Jim's assistant, who was at the time the person responsible for, um, you know, uh, screening people for auditions and stuff like that. And I sent my, you know, my resume and pictures of my pathetic little puppets and all that. And, you know, didn't hear anything for whatever, three months or what I was like, okay, whatever, I'm going to keep doing my puppet shows. But then I got a call one day and she said, Hi, can you come in to do an audition workshop? And this is how they used to do things. They sort of still do. Uh, they would bring in a bunch of people who had ambitions to audition and they would have a workshop that would last for like two weeks. And at first there would be 125 people there. And as the and as the days went by, they'd cut people. And it, by the end of the last week, there'd be maybe a dozen people there. And uh, you'd work on Muppet skills and just in terms of mechanics of lip sync puppetry and then also working to the camera. And she invited me to one of those if I did a pre-interview with Jane, who was intimately involved with the audition process at the time. And um, I... I I came in and I did my pre-interview with Jane, uh, which was really interesting because mostly we just sat and talked, but she did partway through the audition, quote unquote interview. She, she handed me a puppet and she said, okay, I want you to lip sync to this radio. And she just turned on the radio that was in her office and, and had me lip sync randomly to whatever was coming on the radio, whether it was talking or singing or whatever. And she changed channels as I was, as I was doing this. And so she was trying to find out, you know, A, if I had good enough technique with lip sync stuff to follow something else. And if I could follow it, you know, randomly with it mm -hmm. changing constantly. So that was my pre-interview with Jane. She said, great, you'll hear from us whenever. And then, you know, life goes on. I don't hear anything for weeks. I just keep doing my puppet shows and my live puppet shows. And I was still, I still had a lot of clients in Pennsylvania. So I was traveling back and forth to Pennsylvania. And one day I got a, I got a call from Jim's assistant and she was like, can you come in and do an audition workshop? And the way the schedule landed, I couldn't do it because I was committed to a long-term residency in Pennsylvania at the time, a place that I'd been, you know, working for years. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can't, no, I can't come in. She said, well, like, when could you come in? And I said, well, you know, out of that two weeks, I, I, I've, I've got the last day I could come on Friday. And for whatever reason, and to this day, I've, I'll never understand. They said, okay. So I came in. For the last day of a workshop that had been already going on for two weeks and when i got there they were like well why don't you come to why don't you come to the townhouse and um jim's in town why don't why don't, why don't you meet jim why don't you have an interview with jim oh wow and wow. this was all you know this was all a surprise i didn't know that until i got there mm -hmm. right you know? and yeah. so i had this brief meeting with jim um in one of the downstairs offices um that was the first time i'd ever met him he just happened to be in town and you know because jim jim was so rarely in town he was always back that was that was 1986 by the way october of 1986 and he was always zooming back and forth he they still had fraggle rock in production at that time and blah 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 i mean he was he was never in one place for very long that's just what jim was but he happened to be there that day so i met him and i had my interview and the workshop was at like, I don't know, six o'clock or seven o'clock at night or something like that. And I went to the audition workshop. Again, the, for, remember, this is the last day of a two week period that started with like a hundred people and came down to 12 people. Other people who were in that audition workshop were David Rudman, Camille Benara. It was yeah. being facilitated by Marty Robinson and Jane and Kevin Clash. Mm -hmm. And um, David had already been working for Muppets for a while. I don't think Camille had done anything yet. I'm, I may be wrong about that. 
but you know, a lot of times the, the younger performers would still come to the workshops because it was just good to have, you know, practice or whatever. Um, and Jim showed up unexpectedly. He was wow. in town. He was bored. He didn't have anything to do. So he just came to the workshop. This is something that he would never normally do. He would never go to the first, you know, workshop of a bunch of young performers. But this is also the way that Jim was. He he was always interested in new people. He was always interested in what was going on with the company. And he didn't have anything on his schedule. So he just showed up. And so the very first time I ever put on a puppet in front of a TV monitor, I'd never done it before was after two weeks of everybody else doing it for two weeks and in front of Jim Henson. Mm. It was oh, wow. Nice. Uh, talk about being intimidated. But <laughs> my, because, you know, working to a monitor is an entirely different thing than working live. Working live, yeah. you know, normally when you rehearse, you know, live things, you're working in a mirror. So everything that's on your right is on your right. But when you work for TV, everything on your left is on your right and everything on your right is from your left because you're working to the camera's point of view, which is opposite view. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, somehow I survived and a couple months later I started working with them and that's that was my journey to working with, uh, working with Jim. And a couple months later, uh, they started their new season of Sesame Street. That was season 20. Um, they were looking for people to do stuff um for uh carol spinny oh. um they they uh, oh, they goodness. they wanted every every once in a while they would do new openings for the show you know for sesame street uh and they would shoot new stuff for big bird well they wanted to shoot a bunch of stuff for season 20 and carol wasn't available or wasn't interested or whatever he was in hawaii and so I met, I was sent to meet Kermit Love and he sort of auditioned me and I started doing big bird stuff uh, for Carol and, and personal appearances and things. Uh, so that's something that I started doing um, before I actually started working on the regular season of Sesame Street. So before yeah. season 20 started, I was doing these big bird things during this previous summer Um and I was doing the um, the openings for for season twenty, the big anniversary season, which seemed like, wow, Sesame Street has been on the air forever. It's twenty years. And now we're in like what fifty five, so uh, or fifty four. Um, so that was so that was a big deal. And uh, you know, I worked with Jim for a little over two and a half years before he passed, and then I worked on Sesame Street for a com uh, a com. In, in total for 15 years um after jim passed i was working on sesame street and i got a call in the muppet room at sesame street they were doing a ninja turtles movie and one of their puppeteers had dropped out and they needed somebody to uh replace that person and brian henson was on the phone with me and he said well jim told me that you were a quick study and we wondered if you'd like to learn how to do the animatronic system that we've developed and come down and do the Ninja Turtles movie. So I actually left Sesame Street that season and went and did the Ninja Turtles movie. And that was the first time I worked for the Creature Shop. Nice. Um, so um, very good movie, and, too. You know, oh, and, yeah. so that was so that was the second Ninja Turtle movie. Mm hmm. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Because you, you did the second and the third one, right? Right. The second one, yes. which was a Hanson which was a Henson Creature Shop project. And I puppeteered uh, Toka, this, uh, the mutant snapping turtle, the bad guy. Oh, okay, yeah. And three, which was went into production the, the following year, which was not a Henson workshop uh, production. They, they went with a different company on the third one. Um, Henson wanted more money to do the third one. And the producers who were trying to do it cheaper said no and hired... Uh, Eric Allard's uh, All Effects Company. So it was a different company doing the animatronics for the third one. And the third one I did, I puppeteered Donatello. Oh, nice. Really so nice. that takes oh, us up awesome. to 1993 or so. <laughs> 
um let's see and then i and i puppeteered on men in black and that, that oh was, yes wow that was the last a really good movie that was the last well you know it's funny too because none of the new york puppeteers got credit for it um uh, most of the there was only one there was only one scene with puppet uh puppet shot in new york city on a location everything was done in la except they did um the regic baby being born in the park um uh, as the regics are trying to skip town uh there's a the baby is you know they're in the car and they're in a park and uh k and j are uh stopping them from leaving the uh, new york city area un- oh, yeah. and yeah. the baby comes popping out of the car and all that sort of stuff that was the only puppet that was shot in new york everything else was in la and they had already given so many puppeteers credit for all the work they'd done in la by union regulations, you only have to credit X number of people on screen. Oh, okay. So they used up X to credit all the people in LA. So nobody who worked on that one scene in New York got screen credits. That was me and Peter Lentz and Fran Brill oh, yeah. and Robin Walsh. I'm and I'm tears. getting somebody else. Brad Abril, who was actually based on oh, yeah. Rick Baker's crew. Yeah. I think that's everybody. And I and I I puppeteered I puppeteered the baby's mouth. And it's a and it's a funny story because Barry Sonnenfeld, the guy who directed the film, uh is famously not fond of shooting on location. And mm-hmm. we were shooting in Liberty State Park in New Jersey on the 3rd of July. Um and it was like 95 degrees. And uh-huh. Barry Sonnenfeld was in a bad mood because he doesn't like shooting on location. And there were, you know, Liberty State Park is new near Newark Airport. So there were planes flying over all the time. There was all this noise. It was very disruptive. And he was like, I'm going to have to loop everything, blah, blah, blah. And we had been spending the week previous to the shoot rehearsing with this tentacle baby thing. So we could do all these amazing things with all those, those practical tentacles. We could, we, and we, and we practiced with a double for Will Smith. We practiced all this stuff that we could do. We could pull his tie up out of his suit. We could, you know, stroke his face. We had all this stuff worked out that, you know, a, a baby alien might do. And I was the, one of the reasons I got hired was I, I auditioned. When I auditioned, I was asked to do a crying baby alien voice. And I did, and they liked what I did. And that's one of the reasons I got hired. So we'd always assumed all through the shooting that I'd be doing my, oh, thing with the baby (laughs) alien voice when we got on location we sit down we start rehearsing what we're going to do and barry sonfeld goes no no no, i am will do all that don't don't make any noise so i lost like half my job but i puppeteered the so i puppeteered the mouth and the one thing that we actually got to keep out of all that stuff that we'd rehearsed he he literally said this to, to us he said wiggle barf those were his directions to us. You, you might remember at the end of it, the baby barfs into Will Smith's face. Right, yeah. And that's all he cared about. That's all he was concerned about. All the other business, all the cute stuff we had twiddling with his tie and all that, gone. The one thing that he let us keep, and it actually is a wonderful and perfect button for the scene, is the one thing he let us keep was put the thumb in the mouth. Hmm. That's the one thing in the whole sequence that we got to keep that was ours, that wasn't in the script, that Barry Seinfeld let us keep. And it's it's so important to the scene because it actually caps the scene perfectly. It it takes the alien baby from just being this horrible annoyance and this awful thing to, oh, well, it is cute. You know, so it's a lovely button on the scene. And we're real proud that we got to put that in the movie despite the director. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. So, um, so in terms of like Sesame and the Muppets, you know, what was it like getting to... I guess, work with everyone, like all the other puppeteers, everyone for the first time. Well, you know, it, as I said, the way, the way I came into it was weird. Um, I'd had, I, you know, there were people who had, you know, uh, auditioned for multiple times and had done workshops multiple times and had been trying for years to get in stuff. And the very first audition I went into, I got to start working with them. Um, so it was, it was weird. Uh, it was intimidating. I was, I was extremely um, uh, intimidated by everybody. I mean, you know, and, and meeting everybody, 
everybody was super nice. I mean, you know, that's that's you know, that's one of the things that Jim prided himself on was that he 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 wasn't just interested in people who were talented, he was interested in people who were talented and good people. You know, this is one of Jim's strengths was that he surrounded himself with good people. You know, not not just people who would share his vision, but people who were not jerks. You know? Right. So it was really, you know, it was intimidating, but it was wonderful. I mean, people like Jerry Nelson were always uh, very, very welcoming. Um, the first time you walk into Sesame Street to actually work on the show is so otherworldly because you, you know everybody. You've seen all these mm -hmm. people on TV, you know, for, for decades or whatever. The very first day I walked into the studio, of course, like I said, I had shot Big Bird stuff before. But that yeah. was in isolation. I was just me and the workshop people. And uh, it was Carol Lee and, you know, some of the Sesame producers and a bunch of kids. And I wasn't working with mm -hmm. any of the uh, any of the uh, talent, other talent yet, because Big Bird is his own thing. Right. The very first day I walked into this. Well, I should I shouldn't say the very first time I walked in the studio because I did do one thing before the season started. Um, they will sometimes shoot. uh celebrity stuff in isolation based on the celebrities availability if it's mm. off season they'll they'll schedule it right. so um that was when that was the year this 20th season of sesame street was the year that linda ronstadt had just released the songs of my grandfather album oh uh, yes she was singing in spanish so mm. she huh. they did that um charo song uh which a lot of people know yes uh, that's right yeah that, it was it was Jerry Nelson and uh, Kevin were the leads, and then the backup band was me, Marty, David Rudman, and I. Th I think that was it. I don't remember if there were four band members or three. I'm trying to remember if there was. I think it, that was it. But anyway, so that was my first celebrity thing with other puppeteers. It was crazy i just like kept pinching myself I said, what the heck is this stuff you know linda ronstadt <laughs> one of the most talented people on the planet who who was also you know a really nice person and she'd worked with the muppets before so she was very at ease you know a lot of times celebrities come in and they have a a uh, there's a level of discomfort because it's not something that they're used to right you know they're used to working yeah. with people and they're used to working looking at who they're talking to and hearing the voice come from what they're talking to instead of looking here and hearing the voice come from over there or somewhere or whatever, you know, it's right. just a different world, but she was very comfortable with it. And, you know, so she was yakking with Jerry and trading old stories about, you know, the Muppet show and all that sort of stuff. So that was great. But the very first time I walked into the studio for a Sesame street shoot on the set was so bizarre because it's like I said, you know, this is this place you've been watching. You've seen for decades. And all these people who you've seen on TV, uh, the very first human performer that I met on Sesame Street was the late Bob McGrath. Oh, and I just I walked, walked into the studio and, you know, the, the way the studio was built, it was weird because, you know, there's these circuitous little hallways and stuff to get to the studio. You open these soundproof doors that go into the studio and then it's just bam, there it is, you know, and it's such a huge set. Um, yeah. I don't think people under, sort of comprehend in the world of television what a big set that is. I mean, it, yeah. you know, it's two story buildings for crying out loud and uh, and a, a whole street corner. And anyway, so I walked down on the set and there's Bob talking to John Stone, you know, about what they're going to shoot that day. And I was just like, this is weird. I, you know, getting this into my head, <laughs> but you really quickly have to dismiss all those things. And just he, I'm here to do my job. You gotta, you gotta focus in right away. If you're just sitting there starstruck all the time, you'll never do work. You mm -hmm. know. So you right. very quickly have to go. Okay, I'm here to to work, focus, and you know, narrow down your thing. And of course, guys like Bob. I mean, Bob was such a nice guy. He was so he was so tremendous, and his death yeah. was a real big loss to the Sesame Street family. He was such a great guy. Oh, sure. Um, you yeah. know, and Emilio before him. Emilio was one oh, of yeah. my favorite people. He was always so kind. He was always, "Hey, mm -hmm. Rick, how are you? So good to see you." And he was great. He was, yeah, because we recent we recently spoke to uh, Allison Bartlett, and she t talked a lot about working with uh, Bob and Emilio. Yeah, yeah. No, they were they were 
they were, I mean, and, and Alan Muraoka said it on the, on the Emmy tribute thing. He was like, you know, you, you see them on TV and you sort of think, you know, them. well, it's cause you do, because what they did on camera was very, very honest. Yeah, and, exactly. and they weren't, they weren't playing characters. It wasn't Peter Falk playing Columbo, Bob and Emilio were Bob and Louise, you know, they, one of the yes. one of the things that Sesame Street always worked hard on was for the adult characters to be very natural. And so a lot of what you see of the human characters is them. I mean, you see Alan on Sesame Street. You kind of know who Alan is. He's he's a he's a great guy. He's a nice guy. And all the warmth that you feel of him on camera, you feel in his presence. You know, that's that's how that's how they they cast the show. They that was one of the best things they ever did is the beginning of the show when they cast those original cast people, you know, guys like Bob and and even later, you know, and and Alan is one of the best casting decisions they ever made later in the history of the show. I mean, Alan's great. He's been on the show for like 25 years. I think this is 25th season, I think. And wow. and yeah. up until Bob, yeah. uh, up until Alan. Crazy they hadn't made any casting decision that was good as the casting decision to add Alan. He's great. <laughs> he is. He really is. He so, is. you know, it was awesome. fun. And, and of course, you know, and of course it's intimidating. Like I said, one of the first things I was hired to do was stand in for Carol. And, mm -hmm. and the first time that I met Carol, you know, he'd already heard from other people that I was doing this stuff for him. So it was kind of like, I, okay, you know, um, it's a weird place to be, you know, to be doing somebody else's character. And the first time I had to do Bird in front of Carol, I just about had a heart attack. Um, it was, it was for a, uh, it was for a TV special. It was a birthday, you know, Big Bird's birthday. And we were going oh, skating wow. yeah. and stuff. And we got, we got to, we were out on location and we got to a scene where, you know, in the birthday party, skating party thing, everybody's talking about something that's going to happen or something that did happen or whatever. And they're reading through the scene and we're just about to shoot it. And we're reading through the scene and uh, Big Bird says this and, you know, Bob says this and it, and then Oscar says this. And they're like, wait, we have Oscar and Big Bird in the same scene together. They hadn't thought about it. Somehow that had gotten, you know, through the cracks. Nobody had thought about the fact that Carol was supposed to be in two characters at the same time. So I wasn't supposed to have been, but so at the last minute, it was decided because Oscar had most of the dialogue. Oscar was like, oh, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard or whatever. And Big Bird just kind of sat there and nodded or whatever. And so the, there was a last minute decision. Well, this, you know, Rick will do Bird for this one little shot wow. or two shots and uh, Carol do Oscar. So that was the first time I did Big Bird in front of Carol. And I was just shaking in my shoes. I, 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 it's one thing to do his character in away from him, but to do it in front of him was like a total, total freak out. And I'll never forget this. Um, we were, we were getting changed. So we, so he had to get out of bird, and I had to get into bird. And we were outdoors, and it was during the summer, so it was warm. Mm -hmm. And and I'll never forget. I, I was, I was, I was obviously freaking out. I mean, he could, he could tell that I was like. I, 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 because it was the first time I'd ever done it in front of him. And I'm putting the legs on. I had my own set of legs because I'd done enough appearances that um, they made legs for me because I'm a little taller than Carol was. And um, so they they brought my legs over from the shop and I'm putting on the legs. I'm getting into Bird and Carol looks at me and says, don't sweat. And I was like, oh, that's really nice. And then he left. And then I thought about it for a second. I was like, Oh no, he really meant don't sweat. It's hot and he doesn't want me to sweat in the bird because he's got to get it back in the bird. So that was, that was <laughs> so oh my that is a that is amazing. So yes. what, what one of my favorite things that you actually did with the Muppets was uh the Muppets at Walt Disney World. Can you kind of yeah. talk about that experience? Yeah, that was that was uh well, I want to talk about two Muppet Disney things. I, I did I also worked on the Muppet Vision 3D thing. I oh yes. Very I was oh, yeah. very lucky to be one of the few people outside the poor puppeteers who got to do it. Even Jerry Nelson didn't get to do it. Uh -huh. Um it, uh -huh. Jim decided that Jerry was too important 
to Sesame Street. So Jerry wasn't brought out to do it. Um, and none of his, and just weirdly for whatever, because of the way the script worked, none of his characters were really foundational to the, to the piece. Mm -hmm. So Jerry didn't come out, but Richard was there and Frank came back, you know, to do his characters. And of course, Jim, but Ricky Boyd and me were the only oh, people wow. outside the core people who got to go out to Disney Studios in California um, and and shoot the thing. And that was that was very, you know, that was a very special time because this was a huge this was this was the first step in the Disney process. You know, this is this is when they mm -hmm. were still negotiating the deal. This was the first big project together. This was going to be a permanent installation in the parks. It involved all the park divisions because the live entertainment people had to be involved and the Imagineers had to be there and the park people had to be there. Everybody was there mm -hmm. and Disney people were turning themselves inside out, you know, to to cultivate good relationships with the Hanson company. So it was a big fat hairy deal. And the fact that I got to go out and work on that was spectacular. Um, it was in a very special time. And and Jim was like, you know, a pig in poop. He 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 was enjoying the process so much. He was so excited about the 3D technology and he was so he had such a great time, you know, trying to figure because when you shoot a thing like that, you've got two lenses, right? And they're just slightly offset. And so the distance you are from the lens is incredibly critical. Mm -hmm. And because if, if you break the line lenses, the view of the lenses converge, it spoils the 3d illusion and you just get mush. So there were all these, there are all these little markers and dividers and stuff that we couldn't go past. We couldn't get too close to the cameras and the technical challenges of that Jim was just eating up. He loved it. He loved that sort of stuff. And, um, I, you know, and I, because, because I was young in the company and I wasn't doing a bunch of like, you know, principal characters or, or, or anything like that. I was, I was assisting everybody and I had done a lot of assisting for Jim. I did a lot of Ernie right hands for him on Sesame street. And, uh, we did a bunch of home videos and I did right handed him with Rolf. And, and so I worked with Jim a lot. I, I had, close contact with him and i stood in for him oh. a couple of times when uh, they needed somebody to perform kermit so uh getting for 3d muppet movie was amazing flash forward a couple of months it was only we shot we shot the the muppet 3d thing in like january i think um and then and that was in la at the at the disney studios we were in we actually shot in the same sound stage where they shot Twenty Thousand leagues under the sea oh wow um, i have so many stories again you know your podcast what eight hours long right <laughs> um but if just a few months later they did the uh muppets at walt disney world special oh i should hasten to say that one of the reasons that i was one of the few people to go out there for that is because they shot it while sesame was in production mm-hmm so since Kevin was obviously extremely important to Sesame at that time because he's Elmo and and David had become more important at Sesame at, at, at that point and so forth, none of those guys got brought over because they had to do, and Kevin was really pissed. He wanted to go work on the Muppet 3D movie, uh, but he couldn't because <laughs> of Sesame Street. Um, so a few months later, when Sesame's not in production, they do the Muppets at Walt Disney World. I was not initially called to go work on that show. And I was kind of like, oh, well, I mean, you know, I worked on the 3D movie. Okay, whatever. I can't expect to work on every project that they do. And they'd already started production. And a couple days in, I got a call from Jim's assistant saying, hey, Jim wanted to know if you could come down. Oh, wow. Uh, he thought it would be good to have some more people down here. So I got to work on it. And, nice. uh, and, uh, and it was, and it was great fun because again, it was like, sort of a reunion it was all those core performers and of course jerry was there this time so it was like everybody and and it was the uh, the lighting designer that they had on the from the muppet show it was the director from the muppet show days it was like all these old school wow. muppet show people the the music director from the muppet show everybody you know it was like this muppet show reunion which of course i didn't work on that was before my time um, so there was a lot of enthusiasm, and a lot of excitement about that special. I will hasten to add that that's when the cracks in the Muppet slash Disney relationship started to show. We were getting pressure as performers. 
we got our contracts like the day we got there or uh or after we we didn't get contracts to prove and to sign and everything before we started and the uh disney legal eagles were all kind of in our face about hey when are you going to sign the contract when are you going to sign the contract we actually had jim called a meeting of all the performers and said, hey are the are these are these disney guys hassling you and we're like yeah they're kind of all in our face about the contracts and stuff and you know jim being jim reached out to the disney people and had that guy fired and it was like stay out of our face you know we're, we're here to do our job and we can't we can't do it if you're hassling us so there was already there were already weird things going on with the henson disney relationship they were not as pleasant to us as they were when we did the 3d movie when we did the 3d movie everybody was like <laughs> all the time and when we were doing the the special the the live parks because we saw it on location the park the live parks people were giving us a hassle all the time they're like no no this this rock that's out in two and a half minutes you got to be done with this shot for our crowd control reasons you know there's going to be 200 people coming through here in just 30 seconds so it was kind of you know they put up barricades and they were really pissed about us interrupting their traffic flow it was really mm. interesting but you could so you could see that the tensions were already there mm. but it was fun to work on and you know all of the guys you know richard and you know dave and steve and everybody you yeah know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of puppeteers on the mansion, we actually did have we, we actually previously had um some puppeteers on that you actually previously worked with um like Ricky Boyd, Martin P. Robinson, and Brother Abril, which they're really mm -hmm. fun to talk with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Awesome. They're they're all, yeah. All Ricky guys. was in Florida too when we shot that. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh, wow. I remember uh, him telling us. Uh, about that. Oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah. That's or, right. No, Nashville area. So it was it was. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, 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 you were on that. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, so he was a part of the company, um, Magnetic Dreams. Magnetic yeah, Magnetic Dreams. Dreams. Yeah, that's what yes, that's right. No, they do. They do a ton of stuff for Sesame Street now. You know, post oh, yeah. yeah, computer graphic things and stuff sure. like that. I mean, yeah. every every time you see a, a a video effect on Sesame Street, it's you know, it's Ricky's gang doing that. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's awesome. Mm hmm. So speaking of Sesame, do you remember the first wall you performed on Sesame on your first day? The the first role I played. Well, as I said, I the the very first thing I ever did for Sesame Street was Bird for the for the opening credits for season twenty. Um, and then the next character I did was this you know mariachi band guy uh, in the um, uh, I can't remember the name of the song. We're Charo's uh, song with Linda Ronstadt. Uh, my very first day on in uh, on the set in the studio, I can't remember because you know they they I worked on it for fifteen years and the, you know all those years yeah tend to kind of blur together right um, yeah the very yeah. first day that yeah, I worked on yeah, Sesame Street was not was not Muppet inserts it was street scenes and I was just like you know a random sheep or cow or you know <laughs> right yeah. <laughs> The things, the things that you do on the street, because there are so many of them, those tend to be the things that you kind of forget after a while, because you're mm -hmm. usually like, you know, a chicken or an owl or or something. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're a guy like me, uh, you know, one of the utility puppeteers is sort of a is, is you know how you'll hear that often referred to people who are doing right hands and stuff like that. Like you'll often hear um, people refer to John Kennedy as utility puppeteer because oh, yeah. he doesn't have a bunch of uh you know primary principal character but he's you know right. he's Abby's right hand and wings most of the time and he right hands and left hands people and does all kinds of you know background characters and stuff like that of course yeah. now the show has changed so much in the last couple oh, of years yes. they don't do yes. muppet inserts anymore i mean they just yeah, don't they really don't yeah they don't and you know and the show's only a half hour now not an hour long mm -hmm. um you know back in my day when I started, the first season that I was on, they did 130. They were still doing 130 episodes a year, and then it went down to 110, and then later it was like 90 or whatever. They kept they kept cutting them, um, but they were. It was while I was there, especially at the beginning, 
they were doing because of the popularity of the Muppet show, they were doing huge Muppet production numbers. There were, you know, there were, you know, a dozen or more puppeteers doing stuff in Muppet inserts, you know, mm -hmm. like things like they don't do things like uh, we are all earthlings anymore, where there's like yeah. 15, 15 puppeteers. They just don't do those anymore. Yeah. Um, it's and, such a good song, and things with guest stars like yeah. um the the opera singer oh gosh her name just went right out of my head oh that's terrible uh where she they were singing an opera parody and there was a you know a choral chorus the you know there were like 15 of us on set that day they just they just don't do stuff like that anymore yeah uh, and it's partly because of time and partly because of expense and partly yeah. because uh their focus is different. They just don't use inserts much anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 almost everything that they show uh now in terms of inserts is stuff that's years old. They hardly mm -hmm. see anything new. All the the only the only new stuff is well, I shouldn't say only. Uh, most of the new stuff is is all street stuff. Street scene stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you also produce the um and you just mentioned John Candy, which is crazy that we, that we also did have him on too. Yeah, that's right. Yes, we did. Did have him on. Yep. Oh, yes. So switching back to the street for a second here, you had mentioned Grover a moment ago, but do you have a favorite Sesame Street Muppet? Well, I think you know Grover's probably going to be everybody's first pick, and that's and that's for a lot of reasons. A because oh, yeah. it's just a yeah, perfect Grover's puppet. He's just a Grover's perfect, awesome. perfect puppet. Mm -hmm. And and I have to and I have to give you a, a Jerry Nelson Frank Oz story because um, you know Frank hasn't done the show in many years um, and I right. remember one day we were sitting in the uh, the Muppet Room a whole gang of people with Jerry Nelson and Eric was just starting to do it was very early in Eric's career we're doing Frank's characters and it was very early on in him doing Grover. And of course, the, the 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 first word that comes to mind when you say Grover is cute. You know, Grover is a cute character. He's enthusiastic and 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 he's and he's huge. There's nothing subtle about him. And the thing that Gary, or excuse me, the thing that Jerry Nelson said to Eric was, "Remember that you are the cutest monster in the world." <laughs> everything everything that frank it does is the most whatever it is no. bert is the biggest nerd in the world grover is the cutest monster in the world <laughs> miss piggy is the most demanding diva in the world everything that frank does, <laughs> yes everything that frank does that's so that true was, that was oh that gosh. was jerry like being not so subtle about frank you know? uh -huh. <laughs> don't remember remember you are the cutest monster yeah so yeah, Grover. I mean, you know, and obviously I have a soft spot in my heart for Big Bird because I oh, yeah. a bunch right. of Bird. Uh and and Bird is so hard. It is so much work. Um it 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 yeah. is I mean what people people don't realize how hard Carol was working all those years. And and it's amazing that he did it for so long. Because it is hard, yeah. it is hard physically, not because the bird is so freaking heavy heavy necessary it's not like oh my god it's 35 pounds oh that's so heavy it's it's not just because it's heavy it's because you're locked into a position if you're doing grover mm. if you're running around doing grover you can do this you can see the distance between my arm and my head right yeah you, you can put your muscles in different places so the fatigue doesn't set in the same if you're doing bird you're here and that's the only place that you can be. You can't do your arm over here. It has to be here. Yeah. You can't oh you can't gosh. do it here or his next bust. You got to be up here. So the, the position that you have to work in for Bird is very restricting. And not yes. only is Bird's head big, but you have to remember that that how long that beak is. His beak comes out to like here. His beak is like a foot and a half long. And so you have to, you know, and your hands are only back here. So you have to use all that force to get this opening that's way over here, a foot and a half from your hand to open. You know, the, the amount of control. One of the things I did to train for Big Bird 
was I put an elastic band over the front of my fingers. And so there would be, so there would be force that I'd have to push against. That's the thing about Berg. You had to push really, you get, you get an incredibly strong, weird thumb muscle. This muscle right here gets a whole crap load of workout because you have to push the mouth open. You know, so Bert yeah. is amazing. And and Oscar was also a weird, hard puppet to manipulate. Carol was doing Oscar with these fingers here, and the the eyebrow mechanism is your middle finger. Mm -hmm. So you've got a puppeteer thing like this, and then pull back with your middle finger. Now, if you don't think that's a weird cramps thing to control. That they and they rebuilt him completely for Eric. I don't know. I don't know how Eric's Oscar works, but so and there was no and there's because of his mechanism and stuff. Oscar's head is hollow. There's not uh, most puppets. You have a brain that holds your hand in place, right? So right, that it yeah, feels yeah. secure on your hand. But not Oscar. He's got this great big head that's all empty. So you're kind of you have to hold on to his mouth to keep your hand in there. And so I, I remember one day I was doubling Oscar instead of Bird. The, it, there was a scene with Oscar and Bird in it, but Bird had most of the talking. So I was in Oscar and Carol Spinney was there that day. And we were doing this scene and and she was just like right off camera. And I came down after doing Oscar for a while. And I was like, you know, Oscar is so hard. Everything that Carol does is so hard. She was just like, yeah. No. <laughs> no. but but oscar is a great character it's so it was so smart of sesame to put a contrarian into the show put an yeah. alternative viewpoint in instead of everybody being like barney you know instead of everybody being exactly. like everybody, having having a an alternative point of view with oscar is one of the smartest things they ever did definitely a character and, oh, and yeah. eric's oscar is unbelievable i mean I didn't, oh, yeah. I didn't know for over a year that Eric had taken over for him because his voice is so absolutely um, dead spot on for Oscar. Yeah. I mean, it's it's freaky. I mean, everybody talks about, you know, oh, his piggy is Frank Oz characters and stuff. No, yeah. he's 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 his Oscar is absolutely dead spot on Carol Spinney. You can't. You can barely tell the difference. It's amazing. I know, yeah, he does a yeah. great job. And, you know, sure. I think, you know, Matt Vogel, who also filled in for Big Bird for a number of years, he's, of course, now doing Big Bird primarily. Now. Yeah, I mean, he did, mm. he'd he he'd been doing Bird for almost 20 years before he took over. Yeah, definitely. Crazy. definitely. So so I know you mentioned a couple earlier, but um, do you have, like, any other favorite celebrity guests that you worked with on Sesame Street? Oh gosh, there were so many back back in the day. You know, in 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 the uh, late eighties, early nineties, uh, there were so so many. Um, you know, obviously, like I said, Linda Ronstadt was my first, and she was great. She was she was so great. She was so homey and and folksy and friendly, and you know, not not full of crap. You know, a lot of times celebrities come on, and they are celebrities. You know, they're used to doing things a certain way, and they're used to a certain kind of celebrity treatment and okay whatever you know they they come in to do their jobs um robin williams was hilarious i didn't actually wow. i wasn't wow. working that day that he came in and did those bits with those famous bits with elmo where he you're like you know hey elmo what can i do with this stick and all that all those things um but i but i they did them in the afternoon and i I was supposed to be gone, but I was like, no, I got to stay and watch Robin Williams. He was, <laughs> he was amazing. And, and, uh, and it was exactly all those things that everybody has always said about him. You know, he, he was on all the time. He laughed hysterically. He, 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 he never did the same thing twice. Um, he was, he was somebody that seemed, uh, of course, tragically, there were lots of things going on that we, you know, that the public didn't know about internally um but he seemed totally at ease with himself and what he did and he just he was hilarious and so wonderful uh the whole time i i um gosh i you know i didn't i didn't personally get to work with a lot of 
of celebrities because I was just a utility puppeteer and I wasn't one of the uh -huh. principal guys. You know, I, I, what I ought to say is, you know, I mean, people always ask about celebrities and stuff, but working with Jim was everything. It was everything. Jim, Jim was extraordinary in so many ways. Um, he was encouraging. He was um, an optimistic guy. He was easygoing. He, he, he had lots of reasons to, to be pissed off at people and to be stressed out all the time. And he never showed it. He, he was talk about somebody who had, you know, seemed comfortable and it, he, he just always seemed at ease, but there was nobody who worked harder than he did. And, and at the same time seemed like he wasn't working. He was, it was an extraordinary, he was a man of extraordinary ease. And, and despite how hard he was working, it never seemed like he was. When you work with Frank, Frank seems like he's working hard. <laughs> you know, you always, you always get that, you always get that sort of, oh, I'm, I'm exerting myself. Ugh. But Jim was just like, never, he, he was doing, and, and trust me, on Sesame Street, one of the heaviest puppets on the show is Ernie. He's a huge freaking puppet. He's enormous. His body is huge. He's heavy. He's a heavy puppet. But Jim never was like, well, I shouldn't say never. I remember one time I was assisting him for on a song and it was a very long take. And it was the only time I've ever heard him say this. He took down his arm and he went, Phew. I, and I, it's the only time I ever heard him do that. He, Ernie was heavy. And we were, yeah. we were also, I also did, I right-handed him for a weird, weird song that we did. It was, uh, Bert was gone and Bird was gone, and Snuffy and Ernie sing this song, Best Friend Blues. Oh, yes. And Ernie is sitting on the, on the staircase in the alto, and Snuffy's standing next to him. So so Ernie was full body, his legs and everything, and they decided, because of the way he was sitting and stuff like that, they would arm rod his hands. He didn't have live hands. They stuffed his hands and stuck them on arm rods. So Jim and I were stuffed under the stairs, puppeteering Ernie, like through little holes in the in the stairs and stuff like that. And it was a very uncomfortable situation and very difficult because Jim was working to his weak side. Now, you have to understand, if you're a right-handed puppeteer, you can turn your wrist, you can turn your right hand to your left super easy. There's, there's, no, there's no stress, no strain. If you have to turn to notice that if you turn your right hand to the right, you have a lot of limitation there. You, you your wrist yeah. isn't designed to go that way; it goes the other way. And Jim was working to his weak side for that whole saw, so he's turned to his hard side. He's working these arm rods instead of doing live hands, which is what Ernie's normal thing is. And at one part, and and we're locked into these this position because of his you know, being in the stairs. And at one point, Jim just turned to me and went, this is hard. That's the only time I've ever heard him say that too. Jim, Jim didn't care about stuff being hard generally. And he didn't care about how hard things were. He just, he just worked and worked and worked and he never complained. And he was just amazing in that way. So, um, you know, forget about every celebrity I've ever worked with. Jim was the celebrity that, you know, that I care about. He was an amazing, amazing guy and was truly interested and invested in creating opportunities for other people. He was always interested in giving me something new or different to do. That's why he called me down to Florida. That's why I got to go out and do the Muppet 3D movie. That's why I got to stand in for him with Kermit a couple, a few times. Um, he, he was willing, he was daring enough to give people challenges that he expected them to live up to and opportunities. That's that's the kind of guy Jim was. And that's, that's and that's rare. That's amazing. For a guy who's a boss, that's rare. He was, oh, yeah. he was a rare guy. Yes. Definitely. Yes. How much time do we have? About seven more hours, right? 
<laughs> we got to talk about Q. Yes. Yes. Yeah, well, we're, 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 we're definitely going to get to we're definitely going to get to that very soon because I know, uh, of course, it's 20th anniversary. Yeah, 20. Yeah, 20 years. No. So, and were, um, were any of you even born when Avenue Q started? I was I was born in 2000. Because that was 2003, right? When it started. 2003. I, I, I was, was born. Like, Me and Matt were born. Was, Jake wasn't. Okay. Because uh-huh. <laughs> I because I was also 2000. I was also 2000. Because I was yeah. born in 2004, so that yeah. was already when. Just I, missed you. it. Just <laughs> missed it. Dang it! Only by that's so, that's so weird to think about people being born like after Avenue Q. That is such a strange. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have any favorite episodes, inserts, or songs you were in for Sesame? Oh gosh, I don't, I, I don't know. Like I said, I, I worked there for fifteen years, and that's a lot. I, I got to tell yeah, you that I, I really enjoyed working on Elmo's World. Oh yeah. Oh yes. 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 Elmo's Elmo's World. Episodes were Amazing. great because Amazing they segment. were not. 53 puppeteers it wasn't it wasn't dozens and dozens of people it was a small core of people now i worked on elmo's world seasons two and three the the first season of elmo's world i didn't work on right and the stuff in his room the animated stuff in his room worked a little differently than Mm -hmm. by the second season when i came in the core team of puppeteers for the stuff in his room and for assisting yeah. uh, Elmo for all what they called active Elmo shots. Those are things where he's full body uh, and he's doing stuff. So he's yeah. got feet, he's got his feet and both arms and everything. Um, that was me and John Tartaglia and Matt Vogel. Oh wow, which are actually going to be did, John? So we Tartaglia. did all. We did you know we did the dresser drawer you know and we did the computer and the mouse and all we did and the door. Oh and Jim Martin and Jim. Oh uh, yeah. Oh yeah, Jim Martin. Yeah. Four, those were the four core puppeteers and it was very often it was just us and kevin so it was just the five of us working you know intensely on elmo's world and those were long long days um and so those were fun to work those were those were a challenge and they were and it was one of the reasons it was fun because it was different you know we had these little yeah we had these little they weren't they weren't um uh, the the animated stuff which was real time wasn't it wasn't posted or anything like that it wasn't stuff that was animated after the fact there weren't like you know tennis balls standing in for the computer or whatever it was all rendered in real time as we were doing it the That's controllers crazy. for that crazy. were motion control things that were embedded basically in foam rubber mm-hmm. so so to puppeteer the top of the 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 computer monitor rotating at the top of the desk walking with the computer you literally you'd have a sponge with a motion sensor in it and you'd go like this and oh. and the the motion sensors uh would respond to the flexibility of the foam that they were in that's why those images you know the things squish and squash mm-hmm. the way they do that's why the table doesn't just walk in in sort of a static thing like this it kind of goes like this right the motion sensors responded to the flexibility of those foam controllers so the monitor would you know would squish you know and and like you yeah. know when it changed channels you know the screen sort of did like a blink yeah the, mm-hmm. the monitor would kind of squish well you just take you just take the piece of foam and go you know to to do that and so those were wow. fun those were a challenge uh they were hard because sometimes the uh it was just such a complicated setup because it was all happening in real time. Sometimes the motion controllers would lag. And so you do your thing and the monitor would go, <laughs> you know, like three seconds after you did it. And then you'd be like, well, we got to do that again. So those were long days and it was a challenge, but they were fun. And I had a great time working with Matt and John and Jim and Kevin. And, and yeah. you know, and Kevin had so much on his plate. He had he was responsible for so much. I mean, he was the star. Oh. He was the focus of everything. And he yeah. had, a, you know, he had a, an enormous, a, a, a enormous amount of responsibility on his. Yeah. Plate. Uh-huh. Uh, and, you know, and, and, but, and the but home base of your It was great to be, was great to be in that, that core of people. I think 
uh, I think David Rudman was the guy who I replaced. David Rudman did the first season of Elmo's World as one of the core puppeteers. And, you know, one of the things about David Rudman, it, you, and he, it's to be widely and wildly admired, is that David has always had other stuff that he's been doing. He has always been creating his own stuff. Um, mm. You know, like like the Don Quixote show. Is, yeah, uh, yeah. Rudman's project, and you know, I, he, I, I, I'm Jai and, 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 and lots of different things yeah. too. He did that Nature Town. Cat show for PBS, which is an animated show. It's not puppets, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. David's always had something else going on, so he wasn't like available for shooting Elmo's World that summer. You know, again, we shot those things off season, um, mm -hmm. and, and not in the Sesame Studio. We shot them in a studio downtown Manhattan somewhere. Um, so I took over Rudman's spot from the first season of Elmo's world stuff. Um, but those were, those were fun. I, I remember those, you know, the, the Muppet inserts that we did with Jim were amazing. They were so good. And one of the things that, one of the things that Jim realized, even in the world of MTV smash cut, you know, quick cut editing, short attention span stuff is that the puppets visually are interesting enough by themselves, you don't have to do a lot of cutting. You don't have to keep changing camera angles. Just let the puppets populate the screen and they will be interesting. So when we did Muppet inserts with Jim's, the shots were so long. The takes were so long. And that was such a challenge. It was so much work. One of the, one of the classic ones for that, and a lot of people cite it, uh, is oh, the Oklahoma insert that we did with forgetful jones oh yes Mike oh yeah oh, he like, always gets yes. the model sound wrong those were such long takes and we did and we did so many i mean we did like 27 takes of that opening shot with the horses and everything the cows all dancing um those were such incredibly long takes um but they were fun and and jim jim just like smiled the whole time he enjoyed watching <laughs> us, he enjoyed watching us work hard he was somebody who appreciated hard work and and good work. Definitely. So now, yes. you also uh, worked a bit on uh, shows like Bear and The Big Blue yeah. House and Between the Lions. Do you have mm -hmm. any like favorite episodes you worked on? You for know, I, again, I was brought in as a utility puppeteer. I didn't work, you know, like every day of every season for any of those shows. Right. Uh, I I worked fairly consistently. I think what was it? Was it season two or three? I think it was season three that they brought me in. I can't remember. Maybe it was season two. I don't know. I worked a lot that one season. Um, and that that was, again, you know, you, you did, for that show, you did a lot of standing in for other people because there was a small core cast. And inevitably, they would write, you know, all of Peter's characters into one shot. And so somebody would have to do, you know, someone would have to stand in for his you know, one of his other characters, like, you know, Pip and Pop were the, the otter characters, but he mm -hmm. was also Tutter the mouse. And so if you had Tutter and Pip and Pop in the same shot, somebody else had to be, the, you know, so there was a lot mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff. Uh, there was a lot of standing in for other people. And and uh, Tyler did Doc Hogg and Trilo and uh, uh, one of the otters. So, you know, there were like, there were lots of times when you were just, you were in Trilo for that one scene. You know, and you just stand there and or 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 they would throw a one line live and you'd lip sync to Tyler would be pu puppeteering the otter, but he'd voice Trilo live while you puppeteered it so they didn't have to cut or, you know. Uh, yeah. And you know. and it's great that most of them are on most of the bear episodes are on Disney Plus now because. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're just just it's recently. Great. Yeah, yeah, just I recently. Very, I, know, I was very excited about that. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And it was first announced on his birthday too. I'm pretty sure. Which was yeah, cool. yeah, yeah right. Was, yeah, it was. Which is cool. And yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, and Noel said in several interviews that he's done. You know, you won't find another show like it on nowadays. Well, exactly. see, that's so the it's, thing. It's great you know, that it's on Disney Plus. People for always that talk news about, oh, let's you know, let's reboot the show, but you know, it wouldn't be the same. No, yeah, yeah definitely uh, not. You, there's no, nobody no. who would make that show the same way now. Right. That's, nope. that's, that's like, you know, it's it's sort of like apples and oranges with Sesame Street. The the old Sesame Street that we think of, the hour-long format on PBS, 
there's never going to be another show like that. It just will not happen. It's yeah. the way the way that TV is now, the way the industry is now. There will not be another Sesame Street. There just won't. There will never yeah. be a show like that. Also, one of the reasons that Sesame Street was what it was is because it was what it was when there was nothing else like it. Once cable TV showed up on the scene and people were hurting for content and they were like, well, let's do kid shows. Kid shows, we can merchandise things. Sesame Street had all kinds of competition. When Sesame Street came on the air, they didn't have any competition for, for ages and ages. So, so Sesame Street was very confidently its own thing. Mm, right. You know, if you, if, you know, anything that launches now, I mean, let's look at something that's new with puppets, uh, helpsters. You, you oh, yeah. cannot, you cannot yeah. do a show like helpsters without comparing it to Sesame Street. Mm. You know, it's that, that's territory that's already been explored, you know. So yeah. Helpsters mm. borrows a lot from Sesame Street. It has puppets with human guests. And even the, the way the shots are set up looks like Sesame Street sometimes. You know, it's it's uh, it's following a pattern. Sesame Street was its own thing and there'll never be anything like that because nobody will innovate like that anymore. It just won't happen. Also, Sesame Street had government funding, which won't happen anymore. Mm, yeah sesame That's street true, was yeah. made possible by all kinds of foundations grants and stuff that don't exist anymore and probably never will again ever right mm -hmm. so you know yeah i would love i would love to them to reboot bear and you know for noel to get another tv show and stuff but it won't be the same right it, it yeah won't be the same show Right. Because, I mean, exactly. I'm sure all the like people who were involved in it originally, mo most of them would probably love to do it again. But it, again, it like still, you know, wouldn't be the same. Sure. Yeah. Well, and because it, uh, yeah. it wasn't all that long ago. All those people are still in good health and everything. All of them. Yeah. Could do it again. Yeah. You know, and all of them are still were, doing things available like Noel, like Noel's uh, still working on Sesame and he's directing a bunch of them now, too. Yes, he just started directing last yeah. year. So yeah. mm -hmm. just yeah. amazing. And uh, happy for him. I mean, this is kind of this is kind of. You know, this is the way Sesame Street has worked for a long time. They, they, mm -hmm. you know, they they work internally. Um, you know, Matt Vogel has been directing for years. Um, set, Joey Mazzarino jo joined the show as a performer, oh, yeah. then started writing, then became the head writer and was directing too. So that all came from inside. Jim Martin was, had been a puppeteer and started directing. Um, that That's a... a a frequent occurrence yes definitely yes. it and both of them are both of them are really great shows and as well as uh the book of Pooh, which you worked on as well yes. Book of Pooh was very difficult show uh yeah, different different style of puppets too completely technically different it was very style. difficult um because of the way the the full body green screen thing was and it's always hard when you're doing a show to a pre-recorded track. Nothing sucks quite as much as having to be inflexible with a pre-recorded vocal track because Disney insisted that it be all the, you know, the Winnie the Pooh voice guys from the animations who would voice for the show. Uh, they weren't yeah. interested in, you know, Peter's version of Winnie the Pooh. They didn't want that. They wanted, you know, Jim Cummings to do Winnie the Pooh and Tigger's voice. And so everything was yeah. pre-recorded. Now there was some, there was some latitude they could they, they could re-edit and re-record things to a, to a degree, but the pacing was mostly dependent on those voices. That's hard. Yeah, you know, a puppet, definitely. Yeah, a puppet. That's one of the reasons that the Muppet performers do the voices of the characters they're performing. That's why you don't pre-record a track because a puppet will take longer to reach over and pick up this bottle of water than you could ever imagine mm. some guy in the studio is going to go oh look a bottle of water but you know it's going to take ernie oh gee a bottle of water i wonder if i could pick that up oh there it is you know it's it's going to take longer <laughs> it's, it's yeah a different a different you know there are there are uh obstacles physical obstacles that you have to overcome in puppetry that a guy in a in a audio recording booth doesn't have to worry about so that mm -hmm. was a that was a challenge. It, the challenge was also because it was all green screen stuff, you know, with the with the live three D, and it was the first TV show with a live um, 
perspective changing 3D generated computer background. Mm-hmm. So that the, yeah. so when the camera would pan, the background would change, you know, it was the first mm-hmm. one. Yeah. Um, so the technology was new and would break down. And that was a challenge. Doing green screen is always hard. There's always shadows. There's always, you know, Jennifer Barnhart works on the show. I'm like, Jen, I can see oh, under yeah. your arm reaching over to Owl. We got to, we got to drape something there. We got to put a light in your armpit or whatever. You know, I mean, there's it was, <laughs> technically it was a very difficult show. And also because it was Mitchell's big follow-up to Bear. Yeah. And it was like all the same people. It, But in different circumstances, it, that was difficult too. Because mm, they, yeah. they, they weren't playing their own characters. Yeah, they were, they were playing somebody else's characters. So that was that was yeah. that was also that was a that was a, a you know a, a sort of a you know that's sort of a, a I know I don't want to say an insult, but that's kind of a right. that's kind of a little notch to your ego. You're not you're not getting your poo, but you're not not really getting to play the character. You're you're miming yeah. to somebody's vocal track. And, and the puppets looked great, such great. Oh puppets. yes, the the, the mm-hmm. workshop people, the puppet people that Mitchell assembled, uh, and they were all expatriate Muppet people. Um, the workshop people that that Mitchell collected to build those puppets did extraordinary work. I mean, you you yes. see these pup, you see those puppets, and you're like, dude, that that is Eeyore. And, mm-hmm. But it but it could do exactly. all the things that a, a a puppet Eeyore could possibly have been called upon to do. You know that's the thing about animation and puppets. It's different. Animation you don't have to abide by the laws of physics. You can do anything as long as you can draw it. You can do it. Puppets mm-hmm. have a physical reality to them. They can only do just so many things. There are limitations, and the challenge is always. How do you find those limitations? How do you go beyond their limitations? How do you work within those limitations? That's one of the things that Jim was so good at. If if a, if Kermit had to do a thing, he has to you know walk across the street, get into a car, and drive away. There would be eight different ways, technically, that had to be imagined to pull that off. Right. You know, it, oh it, 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 he 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 was so wonderful about that kind of stuff. He he knew that if you use a technique once to do something, then you got to mix it up the next time or everybody's going to say, oh, that's just a marionette. That's that's <laughs> Kermit. Just Kermit is a marionette on a on a bicycle that's on a string or whatever. But in like, you know, let's famously, let's take this sequence with Kermit riding the bike. There's all kinds of different things going on there. Sometimes it's a marionette. Sometimes it's a uh, an animatronic Kermit sitting on a bike that's being pulled uh, instead of being hung from wires. Sometimes in the close-up shots, it's just Kermit with handlebars, you know, bobbing in front of him. It, so Jim uses a lot of different things to tell the story. And that was one of the things that Jim was so good at. He was like, yeah. how do I do this? Well, there's not one way. There's like five. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Yes. And now it's time for us to get to the thing we we know you've been wanting to bring up. Avenue Q, of course. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, we have to. Yes. I mean, you know. We yes. have to. For, the, for those who do not know, uh, in the original production of Avenue Q, yes, this is the original soundtrack, by the way, um, Rick here was Nikki checking. My, oh my oh, goodness! There's yes. Nikki himself. Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh my god! Wow. <laughs> You're actually puppets on the show, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I gotta get into my. Uh, I did that wrong. You should always get into live hands puppet. You should always get in the live hand first, and then get in the head. Because mm, once you get in the head, you, you can't do anything with your hand, right? No. Right. Yeah. So, oh. so I just did it wrong. Oh, <laughs> how are you guys doing? We're good. Hey, how about you? Hey, hey, about hey, you know, I'm good. You know, I spend most of my day on a rack, and then I can come out every once in a while and say hi to somebody. Nice. Oh, that's that's wonderful. I mean, look, at, look at Kate back there. She's just sitting up there. That's yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> rod. And look, there's oh, wait, there's another rod. That's a little confusing. And there's the bad idea bear. <laughs> oh, oh, look, way back there, there's trekking monster too. Uh, yeah. That's how yeah. I spend most of my day. 
Mm. <laughs> just like them. My God. Later on, someone like it dragged out of mothballs, and here I am. Yeah. Yeah. I'm... Definitely. I was I was gonna I was gonna ask this to Rick, but since you're here, Nikki, I may as well ask you. Well, nobody How wants to talk to Rick. I mean, once the puppet comes out, who cares about Rick? Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know exactly. that feeling. <laughs> how 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 does it feel that Avenue Q is turning twenty this year? Makes me feel really really old. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I mean, like I said, like look at it. Look, hey, we're gonna do a we're gonna do a, a Brady bunch thing here. Look at this guy over here, Jake. He wasn't even born. I was on no. stage for two years before he was even born. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I could be your father, brother. <laughs> that was kind of confusing. Oh, well, anyway. I have underwear older than you are. <laughs> Actually, that's not true because I don't wear underwear. <laughs> Until I end. <laughs> no, no oh, oh, man. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's 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 interesting. Uh, uh, you, you know, you guys don't have a have a clue um, to to think about something being twenty years old that seems like yesterday. You know, I, I mean, and the and the journey with Avenue Q was so vast. I mean, when I die, people will say the creator of the puppets for Avenue Q, Rick Lyon, died. You know, that's that's what I'll be known for. You know, people won't say, oh, he was also a puppeteer on Sesame Street or whatever. They don't right. care. You know what I what I'll be known for was Avenue Q because Avenue Q was fresh and exciting and new and an innovation. You know I'm gonna go. Bye. I'm gonna let Rick talk. Hey, bye, Nikki. All right, I know bye, it's not as interesting. Bye, 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 Nikki. Nice, nice meeting you. You'll here. suffer. <laughs> bye, bye. <laughs> that's not. That's right, not see true. Ya. See you, Nikki. So anyway, so yeah, I mean, you know, Avenue Q. Avenue Q was definitely, obviously, born out of my respect for and my honoring Jim's work. Um, Jeff and Bobby, I met Jeff and Bobby. Um, oh, this is, how do I make this short? Okay. So, Jeff and Bobby were enrolled in a thing called the BMI Musical Theater Workshop, which is exactly what it sounds like. It was a workshop for aspiring musical theater writers people who were interested in writing lyrics and, and music and librettos uh, go and workshop um, creating musical things in a, an academic situation with, with mentors from the musical theater industry, like Howard Mencken and uh, uh, I can't, uh, who were some of the people that were there? Oh gosh, so many people. Um Anyway, uh, Stephen Schwartz, the guy who cre you know wrote for Wicked and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. the people would work in these workshop situations with mentors and and workshop uh, things and learn about making musical theater. So Jeff and Bobby mm -hmm. met there. They were teamed together for their final project for the first year class, which is to write a ten minute musical. Mm -hmm. That's your that's your final project. They both they liked each other's work individually in the class, and and they were like, okay, let's work together. They got together. And we're like, well, what do we both like? And it turned out not much. You know, <laughs> they but they both loved the Muppets. That was their thing in common. That was their like, yeah, we both like the Muppets. So their their idea was to write a satire, a parody uh, uh, of uh, a Muppet movie, which was Kermit Prince of Denmark is what they came up with. It was it was a satire on Hamlet with the Muppets playing the characters. Uh, there was it was a mirror universe. There was the Muppets characters, and they were all had uh, counter uh, characters in the world of Hamlet. Mm -hmm. So they'd written Kermit Prince of Denmark, and that's the, what they were working on. They'd been workshopping songs in the class, and they'd been well received by the class. And so along the way, they went, you know, we're writing this stuff for for puppets. Wouldn't it be cool to have somebody come in and clap and sing a song as a puppet? Wouldn't it be cool to have somebody come in and do Kermit? And Jeff Marks had been a music intern at Sesame Street, an intern in the music department until he got fired mm -hmm. for being too aggressive, plugging his own songs. He thought Ugh. he thought interning at Sesame Street was going to be, you know, his his fast pass to getting to, you know, write songs for the show and stuff. And they just wanted him to make copies and deliver them to the studio. And, and you know, they, they just wanted him to go make coffee for the band or whatever. And so he got fired. But while he was in that capacity as uh, 
an intern in the music department. He got to know Laura McLean. Laura McLean. Oh, works yes. Oh, yeah. Laura on Sesame Street, among other things. She's also a good puppeteer. Mm-hmm. Um, but she and Jeff got to know each other. And so Jeff uh, called up Laura and said, hey, do you know anybody who can do a Kermit thing? And Laura and I have known each other for many years because she worked on Sesame Street when I was there and and other things outside of Sesame Street. And so she called me up and was like, oh, Rick, we are, there's this guy, Jeff Marks. Who wants- That's my Laura McLean impersonation. Um, <laughs> there's this guy who wants to do a Kermit thing. Anyway, so long and short of it, uh, one of the things I've always sort of predicated my career on is just not saying no. You always try to say yes, unless you have a better reason to say no. And so I was like, sure. Uh, I don't know who Jeff Marks is. I don't know what the BMI musical theater workshop is, whatever. Uh, sure. I'm, you know, I'm always interested in something new and different. So I, I agreed to meet with Jeff and Bobby and hear them out and see what they were, you know, trying to do. And so I brought my little Kermit replica puppet to my first meeting with them. And they played the song that they'd written for Kermit. Um, I'm off to Denmark. And, or I'm off to Denver. I forget which is the title. I think it's off to Denver. I'm off to Denver. Um, the the twist is he gets on the wrong flight and ends up in Denmark, which is where Hamlet takes place. Oh, so, uh, okay. So, uh. and they played me the song. I think we were at Jeff Marks's apartment. And three things immediately impressed me one they weren't trying to reinvent you know Stephen Sondheim they weren't they weren't trying to imitate you know contemporary American musical theater they they were writing sort of a traditional book musical song two it was a really good song it was tuneful it had a great tune and the lyrics were funny and the third thing that impressed me about it was that it was a really good song for Kermit. They really showed that they understood the character well. They gave him stuff to do in the song that was absolutely 100% character appropriate for Kermit. So I was like, yeah, it's a great song. I got nothing to lose here. Sure, I'll, I'll bring you know Kermit into the class and I'll sing the song for you. And they were like, well, okay, well, how do we do this? You know, um, you, do we hide to do behind the piano? Do we need to bring a sheet to do a stage? And I was like, look, I've been doing this for decades. Uh, I used to, uh, full disclosure, I used to take a little Kermit replica puppet to coffee houses. I had friends who did coffee houses and stuff at Penn State when I was a theater major there. Mm -hmm. And they would invite me to bring uh, uh, Kermit. I have a little knockoff Kermit puppet that I made and I would sing Rainbow Connection. And there was no stage or anything. I would just sit on a stool in the coffee house or bar or whatever and sing the song. And Nobody ever looked at me. As soon as Kermit came out of the bag, they all looked at Kermit. And I knew that a live audience would accept the puppet being on stage with a visible puppeteer. So I said, look, I've been doing this forever. I Trust me, if I sit with Kermit on a stool, no one will look at me. They'll totally pay attention to Kermit and it'll totally sell the song. And that's exactly what we did. And the class went crazy. They had never (laughs) seen a live puppet performance in front of them as, as, as Bobby Lopez or Jeff, I forget who, who this quote is from was like, it was like having Frank Sinatra sing a song in the class. They had a celebrity (laughs) singing live in class for them. And, and the fact that there was a visible puppeteer didn't mean anything. They were totally accepted that theatrical convention. And so it went really well. The, uh, the class mentor went crazy. They were like, yeah, you got to develop this piece some more. So after the 10 minute musical version had been developed, Jeff and Bobby and I worked to flesh it out to a full length piece. And we eventually pitched it to Brian Henson. We eventually pitched it to Muppets. And Brian said, ah, we don't do it. This was right after the disaster of Muppets from Space, by the way. Mm-hmm. Brian said, no, nah, we don't do musicals anymore. Mm-hmm. And, and turned us down. And so after having worked on developing it for like over a year or a, a, a year or so, Bobby and Jeff were like, well, up yours, Brian Henson. If we can't, if we can't bring you a quality thing with somebody else's characters and get it made, let's make up our own show. Let's make up our own characters. And that's when the idea from for Avenue Q was born. So my relationship with Bobby and Jeff actually precedes Avenue Q. 
And it was my relationship with them and the fact that I was the puppet guy that made Avenue Q possible. And so their million dollar, million dollar idea was, okay, what's the next thing that we can satire with, with Muppets in it? That's Sesame Street. And so they came up with Avenue Q, which was an adult flavored Sesame Street. And I have to add that originally it was very much a satire of Sesame Street, a parody of Sesame Street. And it was meant to be a TV show. That's what its original intent was. So nothing theatrical about it. It was supposed to be a TV show. And that's how we pitched it for a long time. But we mm-hmm. did. So we worked on this for a couple of years and we ended up eventually doing a public reading of it, of what we developed so far. And by this time, Ann Harada had joined us because uh, Anne yes. knew um, uh, Amanda Green, who was our original Gary Coleman um and because they bobby and jeff wrote everyone's a little bit racist and they needed an asian woman they're like well we got the song about racism and it's got asian people and black people and you know white people and blah 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 and we need an asian and so amanda knew Anne, so Anne harada came on board um and by now stephanie and john when when we started working on this thing jeff and bobby were like we need we need other puppeteers who are we, we going to get and and i knew stephanie and john from uh sesame street i'd already been working with them for years right i was like you know i i know who's got musical chops johnny and stephanie are the people that you want for this you know talk to them very Um, very very talented we 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 had uh uh, we had stephanie on in the past i think johnny was first after me and then and then stephanie shortly thereafter but anyway so in so in 2000, we decided we wanted to have a public reading where we would present it to people who we thought would be backers or, you know, whatever. And we invited everybody we knew, which turned out to be very few people, you know, in the industry. And again, this is we're still targeting it as a television show, but our workshop was a live performance. So we really had no choice but to perform it live with the puppets and the puppeteers all visible. And after mm-hmm. we did our reading at the York Theater, Jeffrey Seller and Robin Goodman came to us afterwards and said, have you ever thought of developing Avenue Q as a live theatrical show? And when the producers of Rent come to you and say, hey, do you think you could do this as a theater piece? You go, yeah. And so then that changed everything. And then it became um, a development thing with commercial producers attached to be a live musical. And it was never with never any thinking that it would like move to Broadway or anything like that. Uh, the thinking was it would be like Little Shop of Horrors and it would be an off-Broadway quirky little weird thing, you know, that maybe 125 people a night would see. Um, and uh, we worked on it and we workshopped it and we took it to the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center at 2000 in the summer of 2002, uh, which is, they have a musical theater workshop, which is much like the BMI musical workshop, the thing that I mentioned earlier yeah. only mm-hmm. it's for pieces that are already developed to a degree and it's to flesh them out and and um develop them further and see if there is commercial theater potential for them uh and so we were invited to do the o'neill center and the that's two weeks long and at the end of the first week you do a public performance you get feedback on that and then at the end of the second week you do another public performance where you've made all the changes that you based on the feedback you got from the first week. And that second week, because the O'Neill's proximity to New York city, a lot of commercial and non-commercial or um, uh, theaters come people from the development departments of those theaters come to see what people have been working on. There's also a playwrights conference at the O'Neill, but this is the musical theater one. And people came to see our performance and people loved Avenue Q and there were, there was interest right away from that workshop in 2002 to put the show up uh, in a commercial theater. And the vineyard was wow. the, the offer that was most appealing and our commercial producers that were attached to the project, that's uh, Jeffrey Seller, Robin Goodman and, and Kevin McCollum thought had been thinking that maybe we would take it out of town somewhere because Kevin owns a theater and I think it's Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. I can't remember, but we were going to do an out of town tryout somewhere. And, and the, the vineyard convinced them that we should do it in New York and that our 
New York, you know, that our out of town tryout should be right in New York off Broadway. So we went to the mm -hmm. vineyard in their 125 seat theater. And the rest is sort of history. We opened there. Critical response was insane. Ben Brantley, who was the lead critic at the New York Times at the time, wrote a love letter, totally got what we were doing, um, totally got, you know, the theatrical and convention of having the puppet and the puppeteer on stage at the same time. Uh, and um, we moved to Broadway. And that's, that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's amazing. The trajectory there. And of course, it was all the original uh, Johnny, me, and Stephanie had moved. So Johnny, Stephanie, and I had been working with Bobby and Jeff since like 1999 on Avenue Q. And wow. finally in 2003, you know, we got to uh, put the show on. For... So yeah, 20 years. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. And I don't know that we're going to do anything special for it, but have a party, you know, with us. <laughs> but... <laughs> That would be cool, though. Yeah, it would be, it'd be, be. it would be nice to see some cool things for the 20th anniversary. But well, you know, you know fingers crossed. Know. You know, and you got to remember that my relationship to that show is unique. Is right. so yeah. unique. I can yeah. imagine because yeah. I my involvement with Jeff and Bob with Jeff and Bobby precedes Avenue Q, um, and I was so I was there right. I was there from before the beginning, um, and I saw the show all the way to its you know uh, debut on Broadway. And I designed and made the freaking puppets. I mean, who does that? Who who gets that opportunity? Wow, exactly. and I got to tell you, I got to tell you, it weren't easy. There's a reason that the guy who makes the costumes for Wicked isn't in the show. You know, there's a reason. Right. I shouldn't say guy because it's a woman who designed them. But there's a reason that the person who made those costumes isn't in the show. Because you can't do all those things. It nearly killed me designing and building oh. all the puppets i mean when we oh were in gosh. previews when we were in previews for broadway and this is not an exaggeration it's also not a brag it's just the reality mm -hmm. of the situation you know when you're in previews for a show it's not like you just oh well we haven't opened yet but we're just doing the show during the preview period there are lots and lots and lots of changes that go on you are changing stuff every single day so you're not just performing during previews, before you open on Broadway, you're rewriting the script, you're rewriting songs, you're changing the order of the show, you're changing the blocking, everything changes every single day. So every single day, during the day, you're rehearsing all the changes that you're going to do for the first time that night. Well, guess what? It doesn't just go for lines and songs, it also goes for the puppets. So the puppets were changing every single day. So oh I would rehearse all day do the show at night get notes for all the changes go home work on the puppets for a little while sleep for about two or three hours get up go to the shop work on the puppets some more pick them up and take them to the theater for rehearsal the next day and then do the show that night i was doing that for the entire period of our previews which is like a month I was getting like two or three hours of sleep. I lost 30 pounds. Um, oh. If you listen to that, listen to that, listen to that cast album. We recorded the cast album the Monday after we opened the show on Broadway. Oh, wow. Oh, on our gosh. day on our day off, right? Wow. <laughs> yeah. After we opened, my body said, to hell with you. You're not taking care of me. I'm going to make you sick. So the very first chance that it had to have downtime, which was our supposed day off, said, you're going to get sick. So if you listen to that cast album, I have a desperately terrible cold. You oh, can boy. hear it. Nikki, Nikki sounds like he has a sponge stuffed up his nose. We had to, <laughs> and I felt terrible because we had to rearrange the pre, we had to arrange the recording based on how much voice do you think Rick's going to have left? So we started with all the Nikki stuff because Nikki's got to be the best singer. Then we did the bear stuff and we ended the day with Trekkie Monster because who cares how Trekkie Monster sounds? He's a monster. We <laughs> ordered the whole day around Rick's survival. Mm. It was crazy. And we recorded it all in one day. Wow. Wow. And then went that's back to the insane. show on Tuesday. That's insane. That's insane. Huh. Yes, wow. Crazy. So Avenue Q is you know, very special to me. Uh, 
I, yeah, you know, after I was done performing the show and I, and I said this in my, you know, like my farewell speech on stage, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm not in the show anymore, but I'm on stage every single night, every single night, these things that I created are on stage with you. So I'm never, I'm never really not here. Of course. You know? Right. And, and, and yeah. that's, and that's an amazing thing to, to be standing out, out in the wings and to look on stage and see Stephanie singing fine, fine line with a puppet that you made, mm -hmm. you that's know, to, to, to be off stage and be watching Johnny dance around doing purpose <laughs> with a puppet that you made. That's, yeah. that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And then, yes. then I got to go out on stage and perform with puppets that I made. You know, I mean, you know, that, that was a singular experience and nothing I'll ever, you know, experience again in my lifetime. It was, it was absolutely unique, a once in a lifetime <laughs> opportunity. Um, but I will say this, you know, relating back to the Muppets, one of the, mm -hmm. one of the best things about doing Avenue Q was that everybody came to see the show. Everybody. Wow. Dave Goals came to see the show. Frank came to see the show. He tried to come to the show off Broadway, but we had to cancel the show that he was going to see because I fell off stage and hurt myself and we had to cancel the show for a day. Um, while we figured out how to do the show without me and what we ended up doing because Jen, because Jen is Jen Barnhart is my partner. Almost the entire show is with me because she is my right hand person. She was assisting me. She knew every bit of blocking that I did for the whole show. Wow. wow. So I sat out in the house with a God mic and I voiced the whole show and she puppeteered all my characters. And we did the show that way for eight mm -hmm. weeks while I healed. And uh, so that was that was a famous thing. That's 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 one of the one of the things, one of the great things about Avenue Q. And I wanted to show it live on stage because people don't understand how the Muppets work because they they only ever show them from here on up. Right. You're not mm -hmm. you're not privy to you're not privy to what happens because it's a TV show. You're supposed to care yeah, about yeah. the puppet, the character. But so people don't get it. But to put it live on stage, I wanted people to see how a live hands two-handed puppet worked i wanted to put that live on stage so people could see that it takes two people to make one character and what that relationship yeah. was and how difficult that it's like having a dance partner is what it's like you can't you can't fool the other person you can't you know uh you can't do something unexpected that's going to throw them and they can't do something unexpected that's going to throw you you have to be you have to work so closely together in tandem. It's like, you know, Marty and Pam have been doing telly together for decades and decades and decades. You know, Pam Arciero yeah. has been telly's right hand. So they know each other's rhythms. Pam knows everything that Marty's going to do before he does it. And that's, I wanted to be able to explore that relationship on stage. So it's no accident that my characters are the live hands characters. Nikki's a live hands character. Trekkie Monster is a live hands character. There's nothing, there's nothing in the dialogue that necessitates that they be that way. But I wanted to show how a two-person puppet works on stage. And I wanted people to understand that relationship. I wanted to see people to see that dynamic. And it's no mistake yeah. that they were my characters, just because I love working that way. That's one of the things I learned, one of the important lessons that I learned from Jim. Jim was so generous to the people who were assisting him. He always let them do stuff. He always expected them to contribute to the performance in an important way, whether it was, you know, manipulating a prop or just a gesture. There were times when I was doing Ernie with Jim where Ernie would just start talking and he wouldn't gesture at all with his hand. He just he just sit there with mm. his hand motionless because he expected me to participate because like, well, you've got the upstage hand. You're the one who would be gesturing to Bert. He, he wasn't controlling that way. He didn't tell you what to do. He would make suggestions, but he would depend on you to do the appropriate thing and to respond uh, uh, the right way. And that's, and that's what I wanted to show on stage. I wanted to show that that quote unquote lead puppeteer isn't just the lead, but just because he's doing the voice doesn't mean he's the only one there. 
You know, that right. other person is an important participant in that process. So Trekkie Monster and Nikki, I wanted to have live hands because I wanted to do that. It's my one of my favorite ways of working. Like I said, it's like having a dance partner. And it also, it's appropriate that Princeton and Kate are not live hands puppets because they are the romantic leads of the show. And having two bodies for each of those one puppets is just like too much on stage. It's not intimate enough. Princeton and Kate had to be independent enough that they had only one puppeteer. That's why they're rod hands puppets. Yeah, definitely. definitely. And one of the things that I'm proudest of about, about Avenue Q is I got to make all my design choices all at once. I was creating a set of characters wow. all at one time. One of the things about Sesame Street and, and The Muppet Show is that it's a whole mis, mix smash of stuff. Um, Sesame Street, a lot of when Sesame Street started, a lot of the puppets were stuff that was pulled from stock that Jim had. Mm -hmm. A lot of the monsters were things mm -hmm. that used for other things. Cookie Monster was originally that, that eating monster from an IBM industrial, you know. Uh, Beautiful Day, the, the monster puppet had been used for things, uh, you know, uh, uh, variety show appearances for years before it, it ended up on Sesame Street. Uh, right. Grover had been Grover had been made for one of the TV specials, you know, the original Green Grover. So there was this sort of ad hoc. There was a whole mishmash. But some characters were new. Some characters were old. There wasn't one unifying design theory that went into Sesame Street. I got to do that with Avenue Q. So everything in Avenue Q relates to each other. Um, Nikki, Nikki's skin is green. Rod's nose is the same green that Nikki's skin is. Kate's nose is the same color as Nikki's skin. Nikki's nose is the orange that is Princeton's skin tone. The, all the characters relate to each other in, in color values. They all mm -hmm. they all share colors and things, and that makes them feel like a unified family of characters in a way that yeah. Sesame Street never quite, and the Muppet Show has never had. And that's the other thing about the Muppet Show: the puppets came in from everywhere. You know, there were some things that were that. I mean, Gonzo was a a, a, a frackle from the Great Santa Claus switch for crying out loud. You know, he he was years old before he ever made it onto the to the Muppet Show. So the design aesthetic is real mixed. It's very eclectic. With yeah. Avenue Two, I got to make everything a little bit more, you know, consistent. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. When it became not a TV show anymore, and it became a, a theatrical thing, mm -hmm. there was like, there was never a thought about well. Stephanie hasn't been on Broadway. Johnny hasn't been on Broadway. Shouldn't we get other, you know, shouldn't we get Broadway trained people for that? And I was like, no, no. Stephanie and John both have theatrical experience. They are both experienced theatrical performers. We don't, we don't need to change anything up. They, what we, what we need is first puppeteers who are fluent puppeteers or who are native <laughs> speakers of, of puppetry Mm -hmm. who also have theater chops. You know, that's that's the thing about the original cast that no other cast since has been. The original cast was all professional puppeteers. Everybody who has been brought into the show since then were people who were actors who were trained to be puppeteers. Right. That's very different. Yeah. One mm -hmm. of the things that made that original cast so untouchable is that not only were we there right from the beginning and the show was kind of built around us, so it played yeah. to all of our strengths, but we were also what the show needed. We were puppeteers, you know? Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how does it feel, you know, I've your queue, knowing how much, you know, success, you know, it, it, it became? Well, I mean, obviously, it, it's it's the most successful individual project that i've been involved with you know something that i've been yeah. so mm -hmm. intimately associated with i mean i'm very proud of the time i spent on sesame street I'm, I'm i'm you know i'm grateful for the time that i get to spend there but after avenue q um looked like it was going to be a big thing hansen said we're not going to hire you anymore because we don't like you making puppets that we think are making fun of sesame street so that so Avenue Q was the end of my Muppet career, and they've been good to their word. They have never hired me again ever since. So I haven't I haven't worked for the Muppets for 
it's very easy to keep the anniversary of Avenue Q in my head because it's exactly the same number of years since Henson stopped employing me. So it's been 20 years since I've worked on a Henson project because they won't hire me anymore. So I'm very proud of the work that I did with the Henson company, but for yeah. the Henson company, I was a hired hand. I was just a, a cog in the, you know, in the works, you know, um, Avenue Q, I had substantial influence on its creation and its, and its development and it's, you know, what it turned out to be. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't just a performance thing for me. It wasn't like, oh, I got to be known for being this character, which I didn't create, you know, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's so personally it's you know it's it's linked to my dna you know it's it's part of part of me went into avenue q and not just not just as a hired hand not just as a performer um yeah you know it's part of what avenue q is is because i'm who i am exactly so you know obviously it's you know and it's and it's and it's trippy it's trippy to stand outside that and watch other people do it. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's amazing and weird and kind of an out of body experience. Cause like, I remember doing that. Oh, somebody else is doing it now. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah. But you know, it is, it's 20 years old and, and yeah. it's a, it, at this point in time, because it, because it is a contemporary show. One of the things that made Avenue Q so unique on Broadway is it wasn't, it wasn't wicked. It wasn't a fairy tale. It wasn't a long time ago in a, you know, a galaxy far, far away. Or was it was contemporary? A yeah. modern modern American musicals are very rare, and it was original. It wasn't based on a book. It wasn't an adaptation of a movie or a TV show or something that had you know commercial promise going in. It came completely out of left field and was completely original, and. Of of that, I'm extremely proud. I mean, that's it's like you know um, that that doesn't happen very often. And to have been part of that legacy of an original show that somehow beat the odds and and came mm -hmm. to be anyway is great. But because it is a contemporary show, it's also dated. Doing Avenue Q again now, if you had a revival of it that opened today. You have to make substantial revisions to it because it's just nobody. I know it's hard to think of, but in 2003, nobody had smartphones. Right. There yeah. were people who still didn't have cell phones in 2003. The world has mm. changed so dramatically in 20 years that the world in which Avenue Q exists isn't doesn't isn't around anymore. Um, so it's sort of it's it's a historical relic and because bobby and jeff and jeff witty who uh is got credit for writing the book aren't working together anymore you know you, yeah. you, will, you will not see an avenue q movie you will not see avenue <laughs> q the tv show uh, you're it's not likely that you'll ever see a a, a revival of it because yeah, or, or, or you're never going to see guys to work together again and none of them are working together anymore yeah yeah, and, exactly. and you're never and, and you're never gonna see Avenue Q like that ever again, you know. So no, no, and 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 like I said, you'll you'll never see the movie because right. they can't, you know, the the creators can't get in a room together and agree on anything. Yeah. Um, so that you know, there's everybody they've been talking about it for literally decades since since the show became a hit on Broadway. They're like, well, let's do Avenue Q, the TV show now. Let's do the movie. Not gonna happen. Not yeah. gonna happen because those guys aren't working together anymore, and they and they won't work together anymore. Yeah, mm. yeah, that's a shame. That's not, yeah, yeah. So we shame. just have to celebrate what it was. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Are we are we to the end of everything? Is that everything we needed to talk about? It's been like two hours. We're getting close. We're getting. We're getting close. We're getting close. Yeah. We'll just we'll, we'll skip. I can't believe you guys interviewed me and talked about Sesame Street without asking me about Bluebird. Bluebird. You don't even know what Bluebird? Oh, go check the oh, wiki. Come on. Oh, wait. <laughs> come on, Chris. 
You're no, okay, fired. Okay, okay, yes, I know who. Okay. <laughs> I, had to, I had to look at a picture, but I, I just forgot forgot the name. But when I looked at a picture, yes, I recognized Bluebird. Well, it was a blip in the history of Sesame Street. It's it's one yeah. of the litany of failed characters in the history. Of yeah, Sesame I've I've seen I've seen. Yeah, oh my gosh. We only did. We only ended up doing. Um, I think we actually there were scripts for three, and we only shot two of them because the first two turned out to be more expensive than they than they wanted them to be, and they they there was internal conflict about how they worked and stuff like that. There were there was a lot of disagreement, and there there was there was um um it was an effort to give. Big Bird, a superhero character that he admired. It was a, it was, it was, um, Blue Bird was a, a fictional character that Big Bird made up creative stories about. And it was in, oh. in, in his stories, he dealt with personal issues. Like the first one is the Toaster Fixer Upper episode. And that's Big Bird asks Maria to play with him and she can't because she's too busy fixing a toaster or whatever. And so Big Bird makes up this story where the toaster fixer upper is the bad guy. So he's projecting, but he's using this superhero character uh, in, uh, as his, you know, substitute personality or whatever. And it was, it was contentious right from the very beginning. Carol didn't like the fact that there was another person playing a Big Bird mm -hmm. character on the show. Um, it was the the way that the thing was conceived um they wanted it to be um active they wanted it to be like a superhero thing you know with people flying around and fighting and stuff and so so when you're talking about superheroes it's hard to have a superhero that doesn't actually have like violence you know that doesn't have physical conflict and so there are people who objected to the idea of having physical conflict um mm -hmm. within a thing on sesame street and stuff like that. so and 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 ultimately it was also at a time when they were uh working to have more diversity on the show and it was decided that they they wanted to cast a black actor as the voice of bluebird so i didn't actually get to do the voice of the character they dubbed me over and when you dub a character is pretty much always death, you know, um, because all the spontaneity is gone. All, all the all the performance that is captured live kind of gets out the window. And, and so, you know, overdubbed characters are are kind of icky. So there were lots of reasons it didn't work. I think the, the main one, though, is that Carol didn't want to have a competing. It didn't want to have another big bird on the show. Right. It makes sense. It makes yeah, sense. It, and it, yeah. And it, and it totally makes sense. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because because yeah. one of, it's 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 sort of a, it's one of the weird things about having Granny Bird on the show too, when you have two big birds on camera at the same time, it sort of diminishes the specialness of the one, and and it's one of the reasons that at the beginning the Big Bird Granny Bird scenes were always like Granny Bird on the phone. They were always separate. You know, you never saw them together. I think the first time we ever put them on camera together is when I was playing Granny Bird in a in a sketch. And and it's it's a weird thing. It 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 diminishes the power of the singularity of Big Bird, you know, in a in a way. That's that's why that's one of the reasons I didn't like the the Snuffy family thing. Having you know the mom Snuffy and the and the and Aloysius Snuffy having them all on at the same time. It's it's like it's like too much. There's you know too much of a good thing. Let let Snuffy just be Snuffy. And we can assume we can, you know, here's off camera mom or whatever, but to put them all on camera together is sort of, sort of too much, you know, and that, and that, so that's another thing that worked against uh, Bluebird. So. Right. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So now here's, here's an interesting, point. we had touched up on Avenue Q earlier. Uh, very recently you had rebuilt the Avenue Q puppets uh, specifically for the museum of Broadway. Um, yeah, can you uh, kind of Kate are touch on up on that? What is in Broadway right now? Yes, nice, yes, that's right. Wow, well, and before that, that's in cool. 2019, mm -hmm. I donated, I was asked to donate puppets. There are Avenue Q puppets in the collection of the Smithsonian Institution. 
Nice. Wow. Really nice. Which, awesome. I am, which I am very proud of. They're That's not on right. display currently. Right. Yes. Uh, they're not on display currently, um, but at some point they huh. will be. I mean, that's that's quite yeah. an honor. I mean, Jim had to be dead for years before the Muppets were there. You know, uh, yeah. I to to be to be living and to have my puppets in the Smithsonian mm -hmm. collection is an amazing thing. And even even more amazing than that is they were in the cabinet right next to Jim's puppets. I mean, that's yes. that's that's mind blowing. You know, to go back in the archives and to open that case, and there's the original Kermit, and there's all of the original Sam and Friends puppets, and right next door what? are my puppets from Avenue Q. It's wow, just, oh, it's real. Oh my gosh, that's that's, that's amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. But and I, and that was a side that was a sidetrack that I never finished. I said that everybody came to the show. Dave Goals came to the show. Frank Oz came to the show. Jerry Nelson came to the show. Um, everybody from Sesame Street came to the show, and they all said the same thing. They were, it was so gratifying and it was so rewarding. Every single one of them, to a man, said, "Jim would have loved this show." Aww. Aww. and that was that meant everything to me. And I and I got to I got to fulfill a dream that Jim Henson didn't even get to do. Jim always wanted to do a Broadway show, but he was stuck. He was stuck on the visible puppeteer thing. He didn't trust having the puppeteers and on stage with their characters. He was so he was so entrenched in his his television thinking that he couldn't he couldn't quite he didn't he didn't trust that leap. He didn't have that leap of faith that the audience could figure it out, which is so interesting because he he'd experienced that in so many other puppeteers' performances. I mean this is the thing about Jim. He was interested in puppetry as a whole, as an art form. And and uh, saw a lot of puppetry and supported a lot of puppetry, and the fact that he just somehow had that imaginative leap of faith that he just couldn't quite take was really interesting. Um, and and I I got to do it. I got to have my puppets on stage on Broadway. So. That's awesome. That is awesome. You performed the character Swimpy on the short-lived. Um, oh, yeah. Island spinoff, <laughs> Binya that's Binya. So funny. That, <laughs> that's that's the show that will him. not die. That's that a lot of people consider that lost media, uh, because it only showed once, yeah. it only aired once, and there were five episodes that aired. Uh, yeah, and yeah, Stephanie, that's right. yeah. Stephanie played the possum character. That's right. And I yeah. played Swimpy the, the shrimp, and Cheryl Blaylock, who I think you oh, yeah, which you also, which you also, uh, um, was the yeah. little Miss yeah, Ladybug character. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Which, yes, we all, which we also yeah. previously. And you Cheryl too. Yes. Yep. Really, really fun. That was fun. Oh. That was fun. Again, you know, like I said, I I go way back with Stephanie. You know, I mean, I've known <laughs> Stephanie. You know, yeah. And uh, so um, yeah, that was fun. We shot that down at the Nickelodeon, the uh, late lamented. They're not there anymore. Uh, late lamented Nickelodeon Studios down in Florida. Ah, uh, I've seen pictures uh, of it. It, it, it. Wow. It, oh, yeah. Like yeah, a really yeah. nice place. Uh, and oh, yeah, they were and they were lovely, lovely puppets. Uh, Jim Krupa and his gang of uh, maniacs at Three Design made those puppets, um, and they were lovely. Jim Krupa is uh, a, a absolutely fantastic puppet builder and a great guy. Uh, you, I can't say enough about Jim. His work is superlative. Yeah, yeah I'm pretty. Those, yeah. those were really those were really great puppets. One of the one of the one of Jim's. Um, great strengths is he's really good with mechanics mm. and unlike some of the people in the Henson workshop who are like how can I do this thing I'll make it as complicated as humanly possible and ooh, won't this be elaborate Jim's a you know keep it simple kind of guy and and less is more and his mechanisms are so lovely and and effective yet simple because he understands mechanics so intuitively. They don't need 43 servos and 83 different counterbalances and this and that. No, you just go like this and it does its thing. He, you know, he's great. He's a wonderful, yeah. wonderful designer builder and, and he's a great puppeteer too. Yeah, and his team, I think, also did the pup uh the puppets for Between the Lions. Yeah. yeah which I know yes. you also worked a bit on. And those mm -hmm. those are puppets are phenomenal. Yeah. Well, those yeah. puppets, those puppets benefited from not only Jim Krupa making them and his group of people making them. Um, they were designed by Michael Fritt. Yeah. He'd he'd already been dismissed. Brian had the 
great bad sense to fire Michael Frith. And this was one of the first things that Michael Frith did out of the box. Um, and uh, so his designs, you know, Michael Frith had his designs all over the thing. It was great. And one of the nice things about that show, too, was, and it's very subtle, you don't think about it when you watch the show. But one of the things that I really like about that show is that they were uh, invested in working with different forms of puppetry. And not everything is just a mouthity mouthity talking right. puppet. There's lot there's rod puppets in the show, and there's shadow puppets in the show, and there's you know, there's all kinds of different puppetry in the show. And that's one of the things that they worked real hard to do. Um and of course Jennifer Barnhart was the, mm -hmm. the lead uh female um Cleo. Cleo, yeah. yeah. Her name mm -hmm. is like poof right out of my head. And of course Peter Lentz was the dad. Um, yes, yes. And mm -hmm. uh Anthony Asbury was the original uh, little boy, and uh, yes. yeah, Lionel Lion, 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 Lion was no the original take, took daughter, uh, Lion, yeah. and then uh, Pam Arciero took it over. Mm -hmm. Yes, yep. Yes, there a lot, a lot of good work on that show. There is a show that, like Sesame Street in its early days, huh. was very curricularly driven. It was all about curriculum and the curriculum was presented so clearly on that show. It was about learning how to read. Yeah. It yeah. was, and it was extremely successful in um, communicating mm -hmm. its curriculum. It was a great, yes. great show. It's, it's, it's a shame that that show didn't have enjoy greater longevity. Um, it was really well done. It was visually interesting. The set was great. The puppets were great, had great performers great content it's a show that mm. should have survived and like i said it it you know it it was a victim of its times if it had come out hot on the heels of sesame street when the climate was ripe for a show like that it probably yeah. would still be on the air but by the time it came on the air shows like sesame street were already out of fashion so it never it never found its niche you know, it, right. didn't, it didn't get the kind of support that it deserved. Right. Right, definitely. Yes. So a great show to work on. It, uh, it was fun. And oh, yeah. and one of the few shows where the sets were all raised. Yes. You know, one of the hardest things about Sesame Street is that you have to compromise what you do all the time to allow for the human performers. You're always rolling around, holding yourself up with your abs on a little stool on the floor you know, switching around, moving yourself mm -hmm. across the floor with your feet while you're trying to puppeteer to accommodate the humans who are on set. Yeah. The only time you get to play up in the air um, on your feet is when you did Muppet inserts. Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. and Between the Lines was all raised. The set was raised. It was like the Muppet Show. It was, it was glorious. Pretty awesome. And it was yeah. very expensive for that big of a set. Well, that's the thing that that's that's one of the things that did it in, you know, with the, it was an expensive show. This is the thing that people don't understand. The Muppet show in its day was the most expensive television show that had ever been produced ever. Wow. It it was vastly expensive. Sesame Street is still for what it is one of the most expensive. It's got the biggest budget of like any tv show it's uh in its in its you know category um doing puppets is expensive because yeah. for every performer you gotta have you know a puppet for every puppet there's one or more performers so for every character you've got multiple people mm -hmm. puppets don't do things as easily as people to to get up to get a puppet to pick up a bottle of water Guess what? If it's Bert, if it's a rod puppet, Bert can put his hand down to the water. Then you have to cut. Everybody stops. All work halts. Some wrangler has to come out and put double face tape on Bert's hand and uh, change the arm rod, blah, 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 and curve his fingers around it. Then he can start again. And then Bert's got a bottle of you know water in his hand. Oh yeah, there, there's a, there's a everything clip on. working with puppets. Everything is more complicated. Everything's more expensive. Everything's more difficult. Everything takes more time. 
Exactly. There, well, there's a there's a clip on there's a clip on YouTube of some like convention appearance with a uh, Rolf and Bill Beretta was doing Rolf and Steve was assisting him. Right. And they held up Still a bottle of yeah. yeah they hold, held up a bottle of water and they accidentally spilled it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Something else. That was the that was the other thing about that I wanted people to see when we did Avenue Q. I wanted to see them for them to be able to see how puppets deal with props and so the rod hand puppets in avenue q the puppeteer slips their hand down to the puppet's hand and picks mm -hmm. up the water bottle or the prop or the phone or whatever it is with their live hand with the puppet's hand in their hand but because it's theatrical you, you know you don't care right obviously nikki is great with props because he's got live hands that mm -hmm. was one of the hardest things about avenue q is tracking the props like Okay, I've got the hat for the money song. When do I have it? When does Jen have it? When do we pass it off? How do we make you know those things work? Um, those were the 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 choreography of Avenue Q with the puppets was so much more complicated than you can ever imagine. It was crazy. So much time rehearsal, just handing a hat back and forth because <laughs> you don't get us another take. You have to do it live on stage. Definitely, Gosh. definitely. So, so I know because so I know the uh, the interview has kind of been going on for for a while, and we don't have much questions left. I guess we could probably just go to the last couple now. Um, so you know, overall, I told like you eight hours, man, eight hours. You're gonna <laughs> talk to me. You're gonna talk to me for a long time. I have a lot to say. Yeah, I was, I was about to say we. Yes. I was about to say we still got like five and a half hours to go. So yeah. <laughs> we almost have enough time. Yeah. We haven't so, even talked about the Ninja Turtles films, you know. Yeah. And, and my working for the Creature Shop. Mm -hmm. But um, so like, so overall, like, what what do you what do you like enjoy the most about being a you know puppeteer over the years? Well, everybody will tell you the same thing. It's the variety. Is that if, if you are um, an actor, you will get cast to type. You will, if you're tall and thin, you will always play a tall, thin guy. Unless you're Colin Farrell and they put you in a fat suit to play the Penguin in the Batman movie. Um, there are limitations to your physical being. Mm-hmm as an actor that will dictate what you get to do as a puppeteer. You get to do anything. You can be a rock. You can be a blade of grass. You can be a cup of milk. You can be a pig. You can be a chicken. You can be a monster. You can be the hero. You can be the bad guy. You can be old. You can be young. There are very, the only limitations are your talent set. It has nothing to do. It has nothing to do with who you are. Yeah. Actors have to be who they are all the time. But when you're a puppeteer, you can be anything. You know, that's definitely it's that's that's the best thing about being a puppeteer is that you have the opportunity to have a diversity of opportunity that like just like nobody else gets. Definitely. So mm -hmm. Now, we've talked a lot about your uh, work in the past. Can you share any projects you are working on currently? Nope. <laughs> nope. I, you know, did you see Harrison Ford on Stephen Colbert last night? He's like, go ahead, ask me ask me about things. And they're like, well, can you tell me this about 1923? And he's like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not at liberty to talk about anything that I that I have in the hopper right now. Ah, yeah. Oh, God. That's fine. But that's you know that's you know NDAs and show business. That's that's the way it goes. I'm just I'm just like everybody else. I'm just trying to survive till the next paycheck. You know. Yeah. I mean that's that's the thing yeah. about Sesame Street. Let's face it. These guys have been working on the show for decades. I mean, Marty has been working on the show for. I don't know. He started in like season 12 or something or, or whatever it was. He's been working on the show for like over 40 years, you know, talk about sec job security. And as 
having been the guy who created the plants for Little Shop of Horrors, he has a piece of Little Shop of Horrors. And Little Shop of Horrors is the most performed piece of theater in the universe. It is oh my uh, in the MTI catalog of musicals. It is the most performed musical of all shows on the planet. So every time somebody does Little Shop of Horrors, Marty gets a piece of it. All wow. right. So, Gosh. you know, that that kind of career, those kind of careers don't like exist anywhere else. You know, Sesame Street, the the longevity of Sesame Street is unprecedented. And the people who, who are hooked, you know, who are riding that train have job security in the world of entertainment that absolutely nobody else enjoys. You know, it's remarkable. I mean, the only people who've been working as consistently for a lot more money have been working on a show that long are the guys who do the voices on The Simpsons. Yeah, definitely. Of course. Yeah. Marty's been doing Sesame Street longer than Hank Azaria has been working on The Simpsons. You know. Definitely. My goodness. So, so you actually have your own you know, puppet troupe, you no know, lion puppets. So what was, you know, what was it all that, you know, start and how, you know. You Sorry? Know, what, like, so Could like you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you started your, your own puppet troupe, which is called the lion puppets. Mm -hmm. So can you touch base about you know, how you get, how you wait? Well, think I, about, I, you know, I really already it covered started. that. I really already covered that at the at the very beginning. That's that's where okay. I started. I mean, I've been doing, you know, the Lion Puppets has been my troop of of, of puppets um, since I was a as a kid. I mean, I okay. first became okay. I first became the Lion Puppets, you know, like in high school or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And obviously, back then, um, it was just me and wh whatever kid I could talk into working with me, and <laughs> um, you know, for for um, what's, what's really most interesting about the lion puppets mm -hmm. is I never really built puppets for other people until Avenue Q. Hmm. I was known as a puppeteer and a guy who made puppets for himself, but I never was really somebody who you could commission puppets for from or anything like I never built puppets for anything else until Avenue Q established me as a guy who makes puppets. Before Avenue Q, I was known as a guy who was a puppeteer. I was known as a performer. And it was only with Avenue Q success that people were like, oh, this guy makes puppets too. Cool. You know, so Avenue Q was was sort of a, a first for me. In, in in a way, uh, I had never made puppets that other people were going to be using all the time, you know? And I learned a lot from that experience. One of the reasons that the puppets in Avenue Q are as good as they are and as performable as they are is because I am a performer. Somebody who makes puppets who's never performed a puppet is probably not as informed as they need to be. Um, that was that was even yeah. a frustration mm -hmm. in the Muppet Workshop. There were people building Muppet characters, uh, Muppet puppets, who did not understand the engineering of them from a performer's perspective. I'll never yeah. forget we, you know, one of the things that Jim did was he invested in de developing new things all the time. This is something that he probably should get much more credit for. He spent his own personal money on what the next thing that he was going to do would be. And he did experimental workshops where he'd say, uh, why don't you guys just make a bunch of puppets and we'll see what we can do with them. And, and he would just throw, he would just throw the kind of stuff to the workshop and see what people came up with. And I'll, I'll never forget a lot of those people by this time, because the Muppets had become so huge, there were so many people working in the shop and they all had costume and craft experience. Very few of them had puppet experience. Because very few people do have puppet experience. It's a niche art form. There aren't that many people who have any experience with puppetry. So yeah. if you're going to create a talent pool of people to make things for you, you're going to get a lot of people who don't have previous puppetry experience. 
I'm going to look right. for pe people who look like they have experience that is applicable. But anyway, so um, we would do these workshops every once in a while and um, people would make puppets. And I'll never forget, there was this one time we were putting on these puppets and they were beautiful. They looked wonderful. But you couldn't put them on your hand. They were really small and their necks were really inflexible and they weren't built in such a way that like the necks ended up oh. like near the butt of your hand and stuff because they were so small. The puppet's head would like end here instead of down here oh. where you want a flexible neck. The neck was like oh started up here and and it was it was said in a very kind way. But Jim was quick to say, you know, next time, he said to this builder who made these puppets, next time, you know, think about the performer. Think about the guy who's got to use this thing. How, how, how are they going to use this tool? You've made a beautiful tool, but it's not very usable. So one of the things I've always prided myself in is making usable tools. Because my background as a performer, I know what a puppet has to be like for me to use it well. That's one of the things I've always been very grateful for is people who've done the show mm -hmm. have always said to me, Rick, you know, Kate, Lucy, whatever, this puppet works really well. I love, I love using this puppet. It's a really easy use puppet to use. Um, so there you go, puppet building. So All what right. would you like to say to the fans and supporters of your puppetry work over the years? Oh, just thanks. You know, it it I don't think anybody who is an artist with the right intentions in terms of you know, like making art ever goes into it because they want people to go, Oh, that's so good. You know, if, if, if yeah. that's why you go into something to get acclaim, then you're like doing it for the wrong reason. So, so any kind of response that you get from people that's positive, any kind of reinforcement you get, you know, mm -hmm. um, any kind of, you know, you know, positive reaction you get from quote unquote fans or whatever is, is tremendous. And, 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 and most fans are kind and, oh. and, and it's, it's nice. I, you know, I, I launched, you know, I, I, I don't do a lot on social media, but I, I put up, a, uh, I put up an account on Instagram and it was kind of, it was kind of eye opening. I, I kind of was surprised it how many people had been touched by avenue q and how much avenue q meant to people um getting that kind of feedback from people was really sort of extraordinary and touching and uh so yeah so thanks if anybody if anybody likes what i do and if anybody has been touched by anything that i like or inspired by it or pursued puppetry because of me i and that's a weird thing when people come to me and say oh you know you made me want to be a puppeteer that's that's a that's a weird i thing. know yeah oh my gosh um, yeah it, it's it's incredibly rewarding for somebody to you know say something like that to me and i'm, and I'm for sure you know yeah, and and I'd, I'd be lying if i didn't say that that makes me proud of what i've done you know um right. i mean i'm proud of what i've done just from my own self-satisfaction with it um i look at these guys and i think shit those are nice looking puppets yeah <laughs> and they, um, they really are yeah. for other they people are. who think that too that's cool yes, yes definitely yes. so definitely so if people would like to connect with you where's uh what's the best way people can connect with you well, like I said, I'm on I'm on Instagram. I also have a Facebook page for the Lion Puppets. Um, you know, my my emails are all published. Um, uh, Lion Puppets at gmail dot com. Uh, if people want to reach out or whatever, I I would I would warn people who want to reach out to me that you know the Lion Puppets at gmail dot com is a business email address, and I get a crap ton of stuff on there. So if you don't you know, if you don't get a response right away, it may have gone into the junk mail folder mm -hmm. or I just may not have gotten to it. I try. I try to respond to people who, who contact me. But yeah. if you're going to if you're going to contact me about that, 
you know, that lost pilot for backyardigans from Nickelodeon. Don't. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, because, oh because my I God. Answered, I have answered dozens and dozens and dozens of emails about that. Somebody, somebody put my email address up on a, a lost media wiki or something. And people have not stopped comment. Oh you know, my god! Uh, oh my gosh! Contacting me about that, and and there's nothing to say. It was like over 20 years ago. Um, we did, we did a 10 minute demo of it that none of us who worked on it ever saw. It was never broadcast. Probably in the whole world, maybe a dozen people saw it. It were all executives at Nickelodeon. And we literally worked on it for like a day or two or whatever, you know, and I, I hardly remember it and it'll never see the light of day. Stop asking me about it. Exactly. <laughs> I don't... Go ahead and ask the last question, Julius. We usually ask this to every guest. So this podcast. Why? <laughs> no. <Okay. laughs> <laughs> this podcast is called Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. When you think of the word nostalgia, what do you think of, or how do you define nostalgia? Well, nostalgia is everything that has gone before that uh, that you have fond memories of, or whatever. So, you know, for me, Jim Henson is nostalgia. Um, you know, our my family's first cat, Tom, is nostalgia. You know, my the the first time I saw the Muppets on the Ed Sullivan show is nostalgia. Yeah. Um, watching The Wizard of Oz on black and white oh, TV oh stream this big, you know, when I was a kid is nostalgia. Anything that you have fond memories of that was in the past is nostalgia. Definitely. And hopefully, yes. hopefully yes. you're working today to create something that you can look on with nostalgia. Yeah. You know. Of course, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's great words. Yes. Great words. Sorry, that was such a long time, but I warned you. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Hey, you won. No worries. You're gonna have, you're gonna have to go to the, yeah, your yeah, you're gonna yeah, have yeah, to go yeah, to yeah, your edit bay and like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. It was all yeah, worth it. No worries. It. Yeah. It's all worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. All worth it. Either way. Right. But yeah, thanks again, and I will. Well, thanks for yes. reaching out, guys. I appreciate it. I appreciate yes, it. Yes. And also, I, and also I take I another bathroom break for God's sake. It's been, yes. it's been three hours. <laughs> and I'll, and I'll, 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 I'll email you when this goes up. All right. Also, also, we've been can... we've been here almost as long as the Batman movie lasts. Come on, yeah, Get out of here. literally. <laughs> I, 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 so, so I just want to say and thank you so much for what you've done, being a part of childhoods. You know, keep up with great work. You know, I see. You. What's next you know, down the line? And thank you for you know, thanks, guys. For, for, for yeah, let me know when it's going to be part yeah. of our lives. Yeah, we'll, we'll let you know. Because yeah. we'll let you I'm, know. I'm super, oh. and I want to see what I said. <laughs> of course, <laughs> I, I don't remember anything I've said. I have to, you know, look back at it to remember it. So yeah. All right. All right. Yep. All right. Go take care of your dog. Yes. <laughs> yes. Bye, guys. <laughs> Have a great your day, day, Rick. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye, yeah. Rick. Bye. Bye, Rick. Bye. It's goodbye yeah. from all of us, too. Oh, goodbye um, from us, too. Yes. Yes. Until next time, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye. <laughs>